You are listening to the Order Transmissions Special. Episode 28. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. We're back from Vegas, and this is Supplemental Log 28, our first part of our 2015 Creation Las Vegas Star Trek Convention wrap-up. As always, we are your hosts, Jeff Hewlett. And Craig Cohen. So, Craig Cohen, we arrived home. Uh, we flew home on uh, Monday afternoon, and uh, funny thing, I mean, we're going to skip to the end of the con first, I think, and just, just mention that Jonathan Frakes was on our airplane on the way back to Philadelphia. Yeah, as I was loading through uh, in first class, I looked down, and there he was, and I said, hi, Jonathan, and he gave me a nice, cheerful hello back, so that that was cool, about as, as much interaction as you want when you meet a celebrity on a plane. I, yeah, and uh, I, I was sitting a couple rows ahead of you on the plane, and uh, I saw him get off the plane, and I kind of swiftly walked off to see where he had gone, and much to my surprise, and I, I guess maybe I'm naive, I expected there to be people waiting for him, you know, to escort him wherever he had to go, but no. He went over to a, a flight board, and I guess he might have been looking for a connecting flight. And uh, he was off by himself in the hallway, looked a little bit confused, and you know wandered up a side hallway uh, towards another couple of gates. So uh, I didn't stop him or anything. I didn't try to chase him down. I mean, you know, it's a, yeah, I didn't want to bother him. But I just thought it was kind of interesting that I, I, you know, I would have expected him to have some sort of a handler or a, or an assistant there waiting for him. But I guess you know they're just like us. Yep. Yeah, but let's jump to the be- to the beginning of the convention. So we actually wound up having a little bit of a comedy of errors when we flew in on Wednesday. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That flight was miserable. Yeah, it was a really turbulent flight, more turbulent than I really ever remember a Vegas flight being. So, and uh, a- as we thought, we were kind of trying to have a little bit of a race with the five year mission guys because they were actually leaving almost an hour later than us because they had a delay. So we were kind of taunting them, saying that we were going to beat them to Vegas. But of course, when of course we hit the tarmac. And we're sitting on the runway for 40 minutes uh, because we couldn't get a gate for the plane. There was another plane hogging up our gate. Some some nonsense. I forget what the exact excuses were, but I don't ever remember having sat on a tarmac that long waiting for a gate. How about you? Yeah, no, it was um, it was pretty miserable uh, because it was it was getting late at that point, and we yeah. still had to get our cars and get checked in. Yeah, I was I was actually hoping that we would get in slightly early because they actually touted that we were going to get in slightly early, and I was going to grab my car, dump my stuff, and head over to the Masquerade Bar where everybody was hanging out on that Wednesday night already. But it didn't work out that way. We kind of had more comedy of errors when we got to the rental car place, and, and Craig had a snafu with his ID, and he had we were stuck in another line for, what, almost an hour? Yeah, it was close to 50 minutes, I think. Yeah, oh. it, was, it was pretty terrible. God, it was, it was pretty bad. So by the time we actually got checked into our rooms, yeah, it was almost 2 in the morning, so I, it was a— a little late to go back out, so we kind of conked out and, and just had a fresh start early Thursday morning. And um, I think uh, overall, you know, we, we we had a pretty good time every day. Yeah. When we arrived at the con on Thursday, I think we immediately headed into the vendor room to see the five-year mission guys. Yeah, and it's funny. I made a beeline to where they were last year, and of course, they weren't in the same spot this year. They actually had a really good location this year. Yeah, they were right inside the vendor room, two tables in to the left along the wall. So they got a lot of foot traffic around the outside of the room. So it was great to see the guys. You know, we, we got to catch up with them a little bit, and, uh, you know, it was nice to chat with them again and see what they've been up to and talk about Spock's brain a little bit. And we're going to have a couple of the guys from Five Year Mission on this episode. A little while later, so uh, keep an eye out for that. So, Craig, any highlights on Thursday that you remember? Yeah, we sat in on what was supposed to be a presentation from Richard Arnold, who wasn't there. I believe he had fallen down and hurt himself. So another guy stepped in at the last minute and put together um, a little slideshow uh, about the career of Gene Roddenberry. And it was pretty neat. It um, it ran through his... Um, his days uh, in the military all the way up through, um, I guess, his death. Yeah, and I think at the end, they actually spliced in some 
either uh, deleted scenes or or script bits that were never shot for several of the Star Trek movies. Oh yeah, that was really neat. Off the top of my head, I think there was a couple of references in there that almost seemed like pretty good omissions to me. Yeah, and uh, I think there were there were there were items from oh they and also from Star Trek Six by the way they they went into the details behind uh, the reasons why Savick was originally supposed to be the traitorous uh, Vulcan, but they they opted to go with this new uh, Lieutenant Valaris character instead. At uh, I think it was Gene's insistence that uh, Savick would never do something like that. Yeah, so that's why we got this mysterious new apprentice of Spock's uh, that that seemed to come out of nowhere. In Star Trek yes. Six, so that was a that was a pretty cool explanation. Uh, that this is this is one of those things that I think really comes out of the panels. That's fun yeah. for us. I mean, maybe some some folks out there who are are hard hardcore Trek fans may have already known some of this, but there's little tidbits in there that we we didn't know. So uh, we were happy to learn stuff like that. So uh, Thursday uh, evening, I think Craig, you you retired for the evening, and I went back to go to the uh, karaoke party. Oh, right. And I sat through a couple of songs, and, and I remembered that um, uh, Jim Morehouse, uh, by the name of uh, Enterprise Extra, on Twitter had been looking to meet up with us at the convention. Uh, and, and I sent him a quick tweet and said, listen, I'm in the karaoke party, and he ran down. And fortunately, we were able to meet up. He turns out to be a really cool guy. Uh, he's going to be on the next uh, two-part episode here, the second part of this episode along with a, a friend of his who's another podcaster so he actually was in, in case anybody out there is not familiar with uh, Jim Morehouse he was actually on the bridge in a couple of episodes of Star Trek Enterprise uh, that uh, explains his Twitter handle which is Enterprise Extra yeah so he will be uh, when we release that second episode potentially next week or maybe the week after he will be the first person to be on our show that was actually on screen uh, in a Star Trek show so pretty Very cool. Neat. Yeah. Turns out to be a really great guy. Uh, instant rapport with him. And so we went over to the uh, the Masquerade Bar, which is where everybody goes. And we wound up meeting up with uh, Jordan Hoffman, who was very, very cool. Got to talk to him for a while. And also met a friend of Jim's by the name of Claire, who had a panel set up for the next day, who's actually going to be on the show a little bit later as well to talk about her panel and uh, literature influencing uh, Star Trek episodes. So fascinating stuff. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to getting her on the show. So uh, look for that interview in a few minutes. Uh, Craig, any other recollections uh, before we move on to Friday? No, I don't think so. I um, I slept for about 12 hours uh, Thursday night, so I yeah, missed a lot. You were pretty wiped. I think for some reason I was able to burn those uh, the candle at both ends, but you may have been smarter and uh, abstained and actually got some sleep. I, I barely slept the whole trip. but uh, So Friday was a little bit more of an eventful day. Uh, of course, of the first thing in the morning was stopping in to say hi to the five-year mission guys again. But uh, Craig, a any uh, panels that you remember from Friday? Yeah, well, we started right at 10 a.m. with uh, Walter Koenig. Yes, we did. And Walter Walter seemed to be in very good spirits this time around and uh, making comments about the two uh, lovely ladies who escorted him onto the stage, yes. which was was really funny. It was a, was a great bit. And uh, – Really nice to see Walter. Uh, he the last time I, I remember last year, he seemed a little bit uh, a little bit down or a little bit tired. Yeah, and it's nice to see him up and, and peppy. And it was a really good panel. It was really nice to hear him speak. So it was, it was a great start to the day. It was nice they cued him up right at the beginning too. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised that they uh, they had such an early start. So after Walter Koenig's panel, we went over to the secondary theater, which was the the DeForest Kelly Theater, right? Is that what they yeah. called it? Yeah, the DeForest yep. Kelly Theater for the 1115, which was Claire's panel, uh, which was uh, regarding literature uh, in Star Trek, which turned out to be a very fascinating panel. Uh, they, they dove in. There's a lot of subject matter to get through, and I, I think they didn't have a, as much time as they could have had, and I think they could have gone on for a lot longer, but very fascinating to hear about how uh, classic works of literature – uh, influenced a lot of Trek episodes, and I, I think that that applies to us, especially in the original series. There were many episodes that either made reference to classic literature or were based loosely on it. Yeah, you know, so there's a lot of stuff, and uh, Claire's going to be on, like I said, a little bit later and, and can elaborate a little bit more on her panel. So I don't want to step on her too much here, but uh, fascinating stuff. So I'm glad that we got to sit in on that. Oh, totally. Then I think we bounced back over to the main theater, the uh, the Leonard Nimoy Theater for um, at least the first half of the, 
the tribute that they did to uh, to Leonard. Yes, there was a three man panel uh, up on the stage there, and they were going through the early life of Leonard Nimoy from childhood uh, all the way up through Star Trek and and beyond. And it was a very touching touching tribute with a lot of great stories and some really great pictures that I had never seen before, maybe have been being shown for the first time. So wonderful tribute to Leonard. And, you know, I, I remember walking around the show floor all four days. I saw so many people uh, with, with Vulcan ears on, uh, some of which were, were not just the old plastic rubbery ones, but ones that were actually done up by, you know, professional makeup artists. So they really touching to see the outpouring of uh, care and, and condolences for Leonard. Yeah. So where did we head after that? I think that might have been it panel-wise for us. I guess that I might have met Joan Collins at that point. Ah, uh, yes. That's when you stop by to see Joan Collins for yeah. a few to get that autograph for your uh, for your friend. Yeah. And I think after that, we wound up going later in the evening. We wound up going to the captain's chair party at the Voodoo Lounge with Five Year Mission. Yeah, very cool. Uh, what, 50, 50 floors up? Uh, yeah, on top of the Rio. Rio yeah. Beautiful. Um, balcony that they have up there open air so we were uh, hanging with the guys before their set and just taking in all the sights and listening to the uh the cool tunes uh before the guys took it inside and uh really put on just a, a great high energy show absolutely and and i think for me the highlight of that show was they dedicated uh the song i mud to us uh yes. I, I had mentioned how much i liked that song to patrick earlier in the day so uh, really, really nice to get called out on stage in front of all those Trek fans while we were standing there in the audience. Yeah, very cool. Really, really great stuff. So, great show. And I think after that, you headed back to go to bed. And, of course, me being the night owl, I headed back down to that masquerade bar again and uh, hung out for, for quite a while. And I just had a lot of great Trek-related conversations with people down there and uh, wound up heading back, I think, around 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, crazy. yeah, man. So, God, I, I can't believe I was able to handle it at my age. But yeah, hey, go. Yeah. So uh, next day was Saturday. This was a this was an eventful day. We had Shatner, and, and before Shatner at two fifteen, we had uh, J Joan Collins, mm -hmm. and I think we caught the very end of Michael Dorn, who was filling in for the absent Carl Urban. Correct. Yeah, we were able to see the end of Michael Dorn, which was great. Always nice to hear Michael Dorn. Great sense of humor. Yeah, Michael Dorn. I love the fact that he plays this really serious Klingon character, but when you see him on panels in real life, he's really, really funny and charming. Mm -hmm. So, so great to see him there, and nice of him to fill in for Carl Urban because I think he usually does panels with Brent Spiner and Lavar Burton. Yeah. So that was what we saw him with last year, and and the next day on Sunday we would see Brent Spiner and Lavar Burton with Jonathan Frakes as opposed to to Michael Dorn. So yeah. Yeah, the Joan Collins panel was great. Yeah. When you met her at the at the table, uh, how was that experience, by the way? It was nice. She was uh, she was really, really nice. She had a lot of different pictures. And the friend I was getting the picture for wasn't really much of a Trek fan. He was more of a Dynasty fan. So right. she had a couple of uh, pictures from her Dynasty years. I said, um, Joan, which picture do you like better? And she told me. So that's the one I ended up going with. Oh, excellent. So it was a nice little interaction. Yeah, excellent. So next up was the big one, uh, Mr. William Shatner himself. What what else can we say besides the fact that he just he killed it? Yeah, he um uh, that was the day that my brother actually came. Yeah, your brother was there. Yeah, and Shatner was phenomenal as he was the previous year. Very magnanimous, very funny. A lot lot of great stories and a lot of great interactions with the fans who were asking him questions as always. And uh, what else did we do that day? I think wise that might have been it unless we did some stuff in the secondary theater there so i guess after after william shatner we headed out for a little while get a little respite and i think oh, we went to dinner that night at the the planet hollywood buffet that we like so much oh yeah and we went with your brother that was really cool and after that i think you went back to get some rest and, and do your thing and i went back of course to the con and uh, <laughs> went to the the masquerade bar and, and hung out there for a while and uh that night I believe, if I recall correctly, I wound up going to the dessert party uh, with the five-year mission guys for a little while and some other friends of ours who we'd met along the way. And, right. of course, wound up yet again at the Masquerade Bar, which is the end of every single night of the con. So, um, again, always more great Trek conversations and more great friends. And that takes us right into Sunday morning. I think we hit the ground. Uh, I hit the ground running on Sunday morning. I was back up at the con bright and early. 
Yeah, you were there for the uh, the One Trek Mind panel, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was there at 8.30, and, and I stopped by the vendor room, say hi to the guys again, and I wound up going to Jordan Hoffman's panel on the best Star Trek ships, and where the audience was able to vote, nominate and vote on what they thought were the best Star Trek ships. And I actually happen to have, right here, a screen grab of the final uh, outcome of that panel. Let me uh, dig it up. Here we go. Excellent. And I can actually read off to you what were voted as the 10 best Star Trek ships. Are you ready to go? Let's do it. All right. Number 10 was the Romulan Warbird from The Next Generation. Okay, cool. That's a pretty cool looking ship. And uh, let's see. Number 9 was the a NX-01 Enterprise from the Enterprise series. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Number 8 was the Delta Flyer. Number 7 was the Aetholian ship. Uh, this was a little controversial for me. Number f number six was the Enterprise D from the Next Generation. I've never, I've always, I've always not, not been a fan of that ship. I don't know how about you feel about that Enterprise, Craig. Yeah, very Euro styled. Mm -hmm. but, uh, let's see, uh, number five is the Klingon Bird of Prey. Looks like the movie version of the Klingon Bird of Prey, as opposed to the original one from the original series. Number four was the Borg Cube. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Enough. Yep. Number three was the USS Defiant. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. Number two. This was an interesting pick for number two was Voyager. Mm. Yeah. And any guess what number one is? Uh, it's got to be the classic Enterprise. Yep. It's the 1701 classic Enterprise. I was very, very happy to see that make the number one spot. So uh, always nice to see the original series getting some props. Oh, yeah. Against all these new ultra modern looking spaceships. So. Yeah, that was. Uh, I was glad to be a part of that panel. I talked to Jordan earlier at the con. He's a great, great guy. Um, I sent him a tweet, you know, letting him know that I had been there and that I was looking forward to seeing more of his One Trek Mind stuff next year. And he gave us a challenge. Yeah, to come up with some topics. Yeah, we got to come up with some topics for next year. So we got a year to think about it, and we'll be back with him next year. So I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Yeah. Yeah. So after the One Trek Mind panel, I had run over. I, you, Craig, you weren't there yet. I ran over to the Brian Fuller panel with some of my new friends, including Jim Morehouse and Claire and uh, Heather Barker from the uh, unofficial Facebook page. And uh, we sat and watched the Brian Fuller panel, which was fascinating. He talked, believe it or not, he talked a lot about his work on Hannibal, Yeah, which was pretty cool. And I, I haven't seen every episode of Hannibal, but the ones I've seen were very, uh, very visceral and uh, very well done. I think the acting in that, that, that show was wonderful. And the writing is wonderful. It's a shame that it wound up getting canceled. But in the world uh, that we live in now, in the media landscape we live in now, it's it's anybody's game. So, I mean, that show could be picked up by Amazon or Netflix or any number of, uh, of other uh, services that want to continue it. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that show make a comeback. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a great, great panel. A lot of fun. Glad I got to sit in on that one. And I think what was up next to that? Was it, was it George Takei after that? Yeah, yeah, George yeah. Takei was on, on deck after that. Yeah, R wonderful to hear George speak. He, he did a lot of uh, st talking about his new musical that's going to be opening up on Broadway. Yeah, that's been in the works for a while. Yeah, it's relatively close to, well, I was going to say relatively close to us, but since you are now moving to Vegas, it will only be relatively close to me yeah. up on Broadway. And Oh, by the way, listeners out there, uh, you know, not that you would ever notice this, but this is actually Craig's last recording while he's living in Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the middle of a very cluttered house getting uh, ready to load up a truck and uh, and head west. Yeah, so uh, bon voyage, Craig, and, and you know, good luck to you. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be talking to you very soon back on the show. You'll, be, you'll still be the co-host. You'll still be here with me. And uh, we'll, we'll be picking up where we left off. But, uh, you know, good luck with the move and getting set back up again. So thank you. And I'll just be three hours behind you. Yeah, well, we'll make the logistication a little bit difficult, but that's okay. We'll make it work. Yeah. We'll make it work. So let's see. What else happened on Sunday? Then we had our Patrick, uh, Patrick Stewart. Stewart. Yeah. Yeah, the Patrick Stewart panel. Wow, what can you say? I mean, he was just phenomenal to listen to. I, I just love listening to him talk. Yeah, yeah. And he was plugging his new show, uh, what, Blunt Talk. From, Blunt uh, Talk. I guess executive producer Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, and the plugs are working because we're talking about it. Yeah. Uh, I thought they looked very funny. Yeah. And I, I don't have the Stars Network, unfortunately, so I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to see them, but I would love to be able to see them. So maybe I can go over to somebody's house who has Stars. Yeah. And I can watch it. But, uh, you know, to see 
Patrick Stewart in a show that is not something you're used to seeing him in. You don't really see him do a lot of comedy. I've seen him. You saw him on that Ricky Gervais extras show doing comedy, but right. You know, he's you know typically more dramatic. To see him doing comedy, you'd think, well, can he really do comedy? But he it seems like he definitely can. Oh, totally. Yeah, very excited to see that. And uh, so his panel was wonderful. Answered a lot of, of great questions from the audience and. You know, always a, a, a big treat to see him at the cons. I mean, three big heavy hitters uh, doing panels on the weekend. So very, very cool. And I guess to wrap it up, I, I had sat in on the Brent Spiner, LeVar Burton, and Jonathan Frakes panel. And, you know, they they really should take that act on the road because they're like a oh, comedy man, trio. Yeah. I remember them from last year. <sighs> Those guys are so funny. So, so funny. And, you know, Patrick Stewart, one of the best things about this panel at the beginning Patrick Stewart was signing autographs off to the side of the stage. So he was actually still in the room while they were doing the panel. And Brent Spiner is doing this terrific, terrific impression of Patrick Stewart. And <laughs> so much so that they, Patrick Stewart wound up coming up on stage and goofing around with them for a few more minutes. So it was great to see the four of them on stage together uh, having a good time. But, you know, that, that panel was a really great way to wind up the day, I think. They were... Um, they were just a lot of fun and a lot, a lot, a lot of laughs to the audience left on a very, very high note uh, as being the last panel of the day. And I think by that point you had headed back uh, to get some rest, right, Craig? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I guess we went out to dinner before I took off. Right, right, right. Yeah, we had gone out. I said, yeah, let's rewind back as right. My days are getting mixed up. Yeah, we actually wound up having dinner with the five-year mission guys. at a, the, There was a Chinese place inside the Rio. So we wound up having dinner. At the Chinese place with uh, with the guys and a couple of our other friends that we'd met up with there. It was a very pleasant dinner. We had a lot of fun. Then uh, Mike Rittenhouse was uh, was throwing glasses all off the Lazy Susan, spinning it around too fast. and <laughs> We were generally all acting like kids, but, uh, you know. Such is the end of the Trek Con. Everyone's getting kind of punchy and realizing the end is nigh. Yeah. And uh, the fun is quickly drawing to a close. But my fun would not end, uh, thankfully. I was... Uh, we headed back to – I'm not going to – I don't want to read too much through this because I, I mean, we're going to have a couple of the guys on to talk a little bit more about it. But uh, we wound up going to see the Rat Pack show, which is the final closing number uh, for the for the con. It's a group of guys who kind of do old crooner-type songs yeah. uh, about Star Trek. So a lot of fun. So uh, a couple of the other guests that are going to be coming on the show later – of this episode were there. So I'm going to wait and talk to them a little bit more about it and get their impressions. So you get the full story. Cause we had a hell of a lot of fun there. And, uh, that, that about wraps up everything. Cause we started off with our trip home. So that wraps up just about everything. So Craig, anything you want to throw out there before we move into our interviews? Um, no, I guess, um, just a little bit about the, the con experience. Uh, last sure. year we were really excited that they had the guardian there and the transporter, um, this year, they actually had um, a pretty good recreation of the bridge. Oh, it was really great. I was very, very impressed with it. And I know a couple people got their pictures taken on it. And not only that, from what I understand, the five-year mission guys actually did some video shooting there that's going to be used in some upcoming promotion or commercial of some sort. We're going to get more information from them on that later in the show. Yeah, but very cool. Looks really, really cool. I know Donnie, uh, Donnie Versage, who's going to be on in a few minutes here uh, he got his his picture taken in the captain's chair with his yellow uh authentic yellow shirt on so just an excellent photo op oh looks really great he looks very contemplative on the chair there like he's actually captaining the vessel so very cool so congrats to him on that and we'll talk to him more when we get there but uh yeah just you know reiterate one thing i guess before we go and, and move on to the interviews is that um you know i i felt Going into this con, I didn't know what to expect for my second con. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't – we did all our photo ops really last year. There wasn't anybody that I didn't get last year that was there this year. Unfortunately, Sherry Jackson canceled, so I wasn't able to get my photo with Sherry. And other than that, everybody was there that we'd already had our shots with. So aside from a couple panels, I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants with no real plans. And I'll tell you, coming out of this con, you know, and now understanding really what – what the con has to offer and that's that community and how strong the trek community really is and, and right. you know, all you listeners out there uh, if you've never been to a trek con and you like trek you owe it to yourself just to go and see because the people there are just phenomenal the cosplayers are great 
you know, the, the people who just come to knock around and talk Trek are great. And you just, you wind up meeting so many people and it's a place where everybody has common interests. No one's an outcast anymore while you're there. Um, it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. So if you can, if you have the means, especially with the 50th anniversary coming up next year, it's a perfect opportunity to get out there and just meet up with everybody and say hi to us if you happen to come out. Oh yeah. So Craig, any closing thoughts before you pack up your truck and move out West? No, I don't think so. I'll just see you um, uh, in the next time zone. All right. So we will be starting up our first interview here in a couple seconds. So hang on with us. All right. So we are here with our first guest on our 2015 Las Vegas Star Trek convention wrap up episode. And that would be the wonderful and talented Claire Little. Hi, nice to be talking to you. Oh, nice to be talking to you again. It's been, I think, one full week since we actually met in in real life, in in meat space, as it were, (laughs) uh, at the convention. So if you will uh, please indulge me for a moment, I'd like to let the audience know the little bit of the backstory and, and how you wound up coming on the show here tonight. Sure. All right. So... Uh, one week ago, actually almost no, a little bit later than right now, I, I was kind of flying solo at the con, and I was at the car- uh, the karaoke party. It was a kind of a later evening karaoke party, and uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Jim Morehouse, was looking to meet up with us because we had talked earlier on Twitter about the five-year mission stuff that we had done. He's a big fan of them, so I wound up meeting up with him at the karaoke party, and he Wanted to go over to the Masquerade Bar, where, in case you don't know, if you haven't been to the con, the Masquerade Bar is kind of where everybody congregates uh, after the con has let out for the day. A lot of people will show up there. So if you're ever in Vegas for the con, definitely head over there at night. It's a brimming social scene. So we go over there, and on the way, we wound up running into Jordan Hoffman, who is a columnist from the New York Times, among other blogs and things, who had done some panels, and he wound up tagging along. And I think we had gone up to the bar. You were already there. I believe. I was. Yeah, I was standing right next to you guys, and I'm good friends with Jim already, and I desperately wanted to join your conversation instead (laughs) of talking to the person that I was already talking to, who I didn't really know, and I waited a couple of minutes, and then I finally just decided social etiquette could go out the window, and I was going to just butt right in, and so I did. (laughs) Well, you know, I think social etiquette at the TrekCon is, is, is a bit different than it is outside of the Trek con. So I think anybody is allowed to butt in on anybody else's Trek conversations and no offense will be taken. I totally agree. Social etiquette, everything seems so much easier at the convention socially, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I know. I, you know, and this year it, it hit home a lot more uh, than it had the previous year for me. But we can we can reminisce a little, a little bit later. I, I would just want to wrap up the rest of this. So you jumped into our conversation and I think uh, we all we all pretty much well you and Jim were already friends but we all all were pretty much instant buddies at that point. Uh, everybody was kind of just humming along in conversation and you had mentioned that you were going to be part of a panel the following day at eleven fifteen, and I thought to myself I'm gonna have to go and check this out, so that's what I did and I guess that leads us to your panel. If you want to give the audience a little bit of a background on what your panel was about. Sure. So the panel, which I should say right off the bat, I did not organize and I did not originate this panel. I was asked to join it, Mm -hmm. was put together by a woman named Amy Imhoff, uh, or she contacted me through Twitter, and it was about literature in Star Trek. So it was not about Star Trek novels or comic books. It was about the influence of non-Star Trek literature within the Star Trek universe. And so Amy was sort of looking for people to be on this panel with her and was gracious enough to let me join in on this. And it was my first ever experience on any sort of panel, whether at a Star Trek convention or otherwise. I'd never done anything like that before, but I was really excited about it. And I think it went surprisingly well, considering that it was my first time and that Amy and I met for the first time just the day before the panel. So, wow. Yeah. I would have never thought that you guys didn't know each other before then. So I I remember walking away from that panel being thoroughly impressed, not only by your knowledge and and your ability to communicate uh, your knowledge to the audience, but the audience reaction and participation in the Q&A, they were lined up. I was so pleased to see that. First off, I didn't think we were really going to have time for Q&A, even though I really wanted us to be able to do that. Um, because we only had 45 minutes, we, I think, maybe 
crammed a little more in than we normally would have if we'd had a full hour or if we'd been able to prepare a little more. But I was so pleased that we were able to have Q&A and was really, really doubly pleased that people actually had questions for us. Um, I was really impressed by that and, and happy to see it. So it was it was it was absolutely excellent. I'll, I'll just say that one more time. And I remember thinking to myself as I walked out, I mean, you didn't have time to even finish all the questions. There were still people lined up and you, you had to wrap it up. Right. So that is true. Yeah, it was great. As I was walking out and, and down the hallway to, to go somewhere else, the back of the vendor room, I think I was going, I was thinking to myself, like, wow, what an, an interesting topic. And it, it kind of hit home because Craig and I, on our, on our own show and our own commentaries, have made mention of books and literature that, have, that were used to basically rewrite into Trek episodes. Moby Dick was one that comes to mind. Uh, straight mm -hmm. off, because there's actually two episodes in the original series that are pretty much either loosely based on or are almost uh, directly based on. So you have your your Commodore Deckers and and right. Kirk himself actually becomes a kind of an incidental Ahab in mm -hmm. obsession. So putting his entire crew at risk to to avenge uh, his fallen comrades against this monster. So and that that's why it, it re kind of resonated with me. And then I started to think, well, I wonder. If if Claire would be interested in in reprising her role on that panel on our show, yeah, yeah. So I think it was maybe the next night uh, at at the masquerade when I kind of approached you about the possibility. And I guess we're just going to go ahead and throw it out there to the audience. We're going to say that Claire and I are going to be putting together a series of shows uh, about literature influencing Star Trek episodes and leveraging Claire's incredible body of knowledge. And uh, producing some stuff. I guess we're going to start with the original series, but we're not going to limit ourselves to that. Yeah, I'm really excited. Honestly, since you mentioned the possibility of a podcast about a week ago, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot. I find myself just sort of, ooh, we could talk about this or what about that. So I'm really excited to be doing this. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I've actually mentioned this to a couple of our regular listeners uh, that I actually see in in my everyday life and they're very excited about this it's a it's a different angle than i've really ever thought about talking about star trek i mean we always get into the conversations about which series are better or which episodes do you like or which technologies are cooler and but this is this is kind of rooting trek in the real world in our own world and relating it to uh, our own past and our own history which I, I think is absolutely fascinating exactly you know it's kind of easy sometimes to lose track of the fact that the Star Trek universe is supposed to be continuous with our own universe, and mm -hmm. literature is a great way to remind the audience of that. Exactly. Craig and I have often wondered, uh, at what point in in history, in our own history, does, does our universe and this Trek universe finally split? Because in the original mm -hmm. series, they mention things that are in our actual real past. Uh, you know, they have Abraham Lincoln, for instance. Right. So he exists in the Star Trek universe and in our universe. So at what point in the timeline do we deviate? It's probably sometime in the 60s, right? Well, uh, my, you know, my first thought went to the mid 90s with, you know, Khan. Obviously, hmm. eugenics wars never happened or or they did and we all just didn't realize it. Um, yeah. So but yeah, I'm sure it could have happened before then, too. I prefer not to think about when it's split because then that means that it's now an alternate future and I'd like it to be the real future. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be cool if it was the real future? It would be. Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Yeah, I think we had a we had a little discussion at one point about how cool the technological devices we have in our pockets are and how Oh, absolutely. We have our friends at our fingertips at all times and I think it's it's getting there. You know, we've got smart watches that we can make phone calls on now and talk into our wrists like uh Dick Tracy or or like uh, the next generation guys talking into their insignias and exactly. I mean, in some ways, we've completely outpaced Star Trek. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you look at Captain Picard's what's essentially a laptop or a terminal on his desk in the ready room, and it's so thick and huge, and mm -hmm. the screen is small, and it's four by three rate aspect ratio. Yeah, and no widescreen in the future. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we've completely outdone at the very least, to the presentation side of that technology. What's inside that box, we don't know. Maybe it's a far ahead of what we've got now, but superficially, it looks like we've we've outdone them. <laughs> so once your panel ended, um, do, you, do you have any other recollections of things you did on Thursday? Because I think I didn't see you again, I mean, Friday, rather, and I didn't think to see you again until later in the evening. Well, immediately after our panel was the Leonard Nimoy tribute, which I, of course, attended. Um, yes. That's one reason that we had to cut off some people who had questions. 
because it was noon and we didn't want anyone to miss the Leonard Nimoy tribute if they wanted to attend. And I think everybody wanted to attend. It was pretty packed. It, yeah, definitely. And um, so that was wonderful. I stayed for that whole thing. I left. Yeah, after after Adam Nimoy was finished speaking, I left and I honestly don't remember what, what I did after that. It was I a whirlwind. Probably, it really was. I would say I probably, you know, I'm sure I ate. Let's just say that because I did not eat lunch. So I probably ate somewhere, but I don't remember. I think we, um, we all ate pretty terribly over that week, oh, yeah. didn't we? That weekend. Yeah. I mean it's you know, hamburgers, the Wetzel's pretzels. All those are terrible. Uh, is they're they're awful. I eat them once a year so at the greasy. convention. Yeah. <laughs> they're sort of like a traditional terrible food that I sponged it off. Food. I bought one and I sponged it off and the, the napkins were just covered with grease. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they like actually squirt some kind of butter or oil <laughs> onto them when you buy them. <laughs> and you don't it's not a I mean, it's automatic. It's not like a special topping that you request. It's just what they do. Yeah. Honestly, I, I can't off the top of my head recall what exactly I did on Friday in the afternoon after the Leonard Nimoy tribute. I'm sure it was amazing, but I don't remember it. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> So just a word to you uh, audience members who may be contemplating going to the con and, and hearing this food conversation. So the, the Rio is great, but uh, the one real problem with the Rio is that it's not near anything. So you can't mm -hmm. leave the premises unless you take a, ta a cab or, or some sort of car uh, and, and go out somewhere else to get something to eat. Fortunately, I had a rental car this time, so I could kind of go out and get other disgusting fast food. And things like in and out Burger and uh, Raising Cane's Chicken Fingers and all sorts of stuff like that. But uh, if well, you now the in and out must be a special treat for you as someone oh, who is. lives on the East Coast, right? Yes, yes, it is. We you do can't not have... diss the in and out. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, I love the in and out. We, that's a destination. Every I go to Vegas every year. I've been there thirteen times in my lifetime, and uh, I always go to in and out at least once. Okay. When I'm there, so <laughs> so that brings us to the Friday night five year mission show at the Voodoo Lounge. I yes. think we met back up there. So uh, I, I kind of made my way up to the show. Co-host Craig was with me, of course. Uh, we made our way up to the show with Andy and Mike from Five Year Mission, uh, who will be on the show a little bit later. And uh, it was a great, great set. And I, I know you were there with some of your friends, and I believe Jim Morehouse was also there. Oh, he was absolutely there. He <laughs> was rocking out. Does he anybody have party. any video of him dancing? Oh, I don't have any heather might i don't know if she's going to be on the show she might i was taking i took some pictures of the band i don't think i actually got any photos of jim partially because he was moving so fast <laughs> i think it would have been difficult to photograph he was a blur <laughs> yes but he was in um, his element i will say this at one point i believe he interrupted or possibly even ruined Cyric lofton's birthday <laughs> by, <laughs> by nearly moshing into him oh my god uh, that yes. sounds like Jim. Yeah, exactly. He had no idea. We had to tell him afterwards. <laughs> so what was your overall opinion of the show? Were, were you a five-year mission fan before that? I actually, uh, yeah, I, I first heard about them last year because they were the house band. Mm -hmm. And I think Jim already knew of them. And so, and of, and of course, I heard them performing and enjoyed them. And Jim just sort of increased the enthusiasm as he does. So yeah, it been I I I was already a fan. I thought they did a great set. The setup, the actual layout of the Voodoo Lounge was a little bit unusual in that you can't go up to the stage because there's a yep. stairway. Yeah, it's very weird, isn't it? It is. I I I mean it looks good. It's an it the layout makes for an interesting sort of view, but it it's a it's not your typical kind of rock show venue. I had heard that the previous night's performance was great from the band's perspective, but maybe not. I don't know if you want to talk about this actually in the <laughs> podcast, the fact that there were a bunch of old people at the gold party, but maybe we shouldn't mention that. That's okay. I, I was going to mention, I was going to ask five year mission about it, but uh, yeah. I'm sure that they'll, they'll have some, some more insight, but I, I, I do agree <laughs> with you that the layout of the place was a little bit weird because be, between us and the band was not only a staircase, but a buffet table. That's right. Yeah, and yes. people were like dishing themselves out food while we <laughs> in front of us while <laughs> the band was playing. So it was a little bit odd. 
and even after people were finished eating and so there wasn't a line of people uh, there was still one lonely chef who was carving the pot roast or whatever kind of beef that was who just sort of had to stand there guarding these this lump of meat <laughs> during I, the show he kept making eye contact with me and and i'm singing <laughs> along with these songs he's looking at me like what how do you know this who are you who are you I people just, half expected jim to just like pick up the lump of meat and just sort of (laughs) like start furiously eating it Uh, while dancing or something i don't know right out of his hands just getting it all (laughs) over his face i can just picture it now that seems like something he would have done (laughs) so in your mind uh worthy worthy captain's chair perk the party is really fun you know i have to be honest i don't have a lot of experience going to lounges or those kinds of events in my regular life so someone who's more experienced with the sort of vip club experience might (laughs) might have a different thought but i thought it was great i don't know if i'll do the captain's chair next year just depending on how much it costs but it's definitely fun i would not have missed it yeah the captain's chair experience is interesting i i I'm not sure if I'm going to do it either. I we did um I think we did preferred weekend last time and I was thinking about doing captain's chair for the 50th next year in 2016 but yeah. I don't know. I I'm not sure I'm on the fence because if they're going to be the house band uh, I I don't think uh, there's it's necessary to get the, the better seats and get into the the club yeah. as you will see them on stage. Exactly. The uh last year I also did captain's chair and there was different music at the captain's chair and it was fine, but it, you know, five-year mission definitely made it better. And so if they're not going to be performing, then it sort of drops it down a little bit for me. Um, As a side note, not really related to the podcast, Heather and I are both like "Eh," about the captain's chair and the Mm. seats are awesome in the theater, Mm -hmm. but, or in, you know, in the, the main hall. But I mean, I think you would agree all the awesome partying that we did at the captain's chair party we can do and did do at the masquerade bar. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, we really did. And (laughs) (laughs) yeah, thanks for reminding me. I I don't think I got to bed any earlier than about three 30 AM on any night. Yeah. Same here. It was, there were times where I was looking at the clock and it said four Mm o'clock and I don't mean PM. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was, they were all, all late night candle burning sessions there, but it didn't feel like it at the time. No. Yeah, it didn't feel like it. Normally, I mean, I usually in my real life, I'm not up past 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night sometimes, but oh. four, 4 o'clock yeah. is, well, I'm sure you're you're up, you're a night owl. I am a night owl, definitely, but 4 o'clock is still... That's pushing it. Not, yeah, I mean, weekends, yeah, I'll, I'll go to bed at 3, but also, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, but I'm not drinking, I'm not doing... <laughs> you know, running around being crazy. It's you know, like playing on the computer or something. It's a little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit different. It's a little different. A little yeah. Different. So let's see what we, that was Friday night. So into Saturday, I know Saturday was kind of a, a controversial day for some. Uh, it was a, there was some some big panels that went on, especially uh, William Shatner. Mm-hmm. And uh, Shatner, in my opinion, always puts on a great panel. But I think uh, this was kind of a sore topic for you. So I, I don't want you to feel like you have to talk oh, no. about it, but um... the panel was great. I <laughs> a pet peeve of mine about these conventions is uh, when audience members ask questions that are maybe not tactful, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that just do more to fan the flames of any supposed feud that may or may not actually exist. They sort of inject life into it by continually asking about it. It's uh, just a pet peeve of mine, and. So, so I was really crossing my fingers that people would not ask William Shatner or George Takei about that whole thing, which I am now potentially fanning the flames of by mentioning. <laughs> I enjoyed William Shatner's panel. He's always himself. I happen to like his sort of Shatner persona. But yeah, somebody brought up the George Takei thing and I actually left <laughs> because the panel was nearly over. And I also just was extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> And I, from what I heard, though, William Shatner answered the question very well. He um, did. I did not see George Takei the next day, but I, from what I heard, again, someone asked about it, and George Takei also answered. And you know, personally, I, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's sort of like people asking or saying 
awkward or tactless things on the internet. You know, if you were meeting the person face to face in a private venue, you would not ask those kinds of questions. So you probably should not ask them in a room with a thousand people in it. But that's just me. I would tend to agree. (laughs) I would tend to agree. But the interesting slant on this, uh, and I I was going to run this by you as the surprise topic of this of this conversation. So as Claire alluded to, someone in the audience asked Shatner about the feud with George Takei. And Shatner's response was quite tactful. Um, and it made a lot of sense. He was talking about how he really never truly knew George Takei. He was working and he and George, you know, they worked together in some scenes, but they weren't they weren't really friends and things of that nature. So that was really his that his defense was that he really doesn't know George Takei and he doesn't understand what this feud is about. So that was mm-hmm. but where the controversial part comes in is the following day in George Takei's panel, from what rumor has it, the person who asked George Takei the question was the same guy that asked William mm. Shatner. So the theory is that this guy may have been some sort of plant to stir the pot up for a, re- of a reunion and a makeup at the 50th next year. Oh, are you serious? That's the rumor. Oh, that irritates me even more than the question itself. Uh-oh, now we got to really fire it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just oh, uh, on the one hand, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was true. I mean, this is the age of reality TV and feuding celebrities and whatever, but uh, I almost would rather it be no, I definitely would rather it be just simply a tact- tactless, somewhat oblivious fan not thinking about the propriety of the question than it being somebody potentially from CBS or Star Trek or whatever interested party intentionally deliberately kind of re-energizing this issue oh i hope that's not true (laughs) Uh, because Uh. honestly i mean even even if they do get william shatner and george takei on stage together and they shake hands or whatever it is that they would do to to make up quote unquote would that actually put the issue to rest in the fans minds no people would still ask about it i don't think it you know, they could write love letters to each other and publish them for all to read. I think people would still go up there and say, yeah, but are you really over it? Are you sure you're not still mad at him? Because people just love asking about it. True. But they would sell a lot more tickets to the 50th next year. So people could come and witness this firsthand. <laughs> it's possible. They're adding a fifth day. I mean... <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what the fifth day is for. You know, I wondered what the fifth day was for. And it's, yeah, there's going to be some kind of like <laughs> incredible ceremony with robes and It's a day-long chanting. panel with Shatner and Takei that ends in a hot tub. <laughs> now that I would actually want to see. <laughs> um, no, yeah, it would just be, you know, hundreds of fans asking, but are you sure you're not still mad at him? Over and over and over again. <laughs> Well, it's going to be interesting. And, uh, you know, one th- you didn't say you said you didn't go to the George Takei panel, right? You know, I said that I didn't, but then I was thinking about it. I think I did because I heard him talking about Howard Stern. So yeah, maybe I, was just I bring that up. when George Takei was asked the same question. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. And- oh, no, no. I didn't leave. I squirmed. I actively wiggled around in my seat <laughs> and squirmed. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I I I love the um, actually we're jumping ahead if we're going to talk about the George Takei panel so that's actually the next day so there's more okay. stuff that actually happened on on Saturday right so wow uh, I'm sure Shatner was about two o'clock so you, you also the Joan Crawford panel which was a little bit earlier than that did you attend that as well I you know I didn't um, I I know Ooh. from my perspective you know her career has been so long and the City on mm. the Edge of Forever was basically a blip um Mm -hmm. i again it was basically to avoid um odd awkward fan questions i was concerned that people would be asking questions that were extremely specific to the episode which is already a problem for people who were cat regular cast for cast members you know for joan collins to to remember you know what she was thinking in scene three of act two of something that she did almost 50 years ago that was one job in her whole long career. I just, I just thought it would be more than I really wanted to sit through (laughs) to be completely honest. Um, And the rest of her career, I didn't, I haven't followed at all. So I do, I don't really 
know much about her as an actress. So you pretty much nailed her answer to those fan questions. Did I really? So, yeah. So the the questions were anything that they asked her essentially about the episode. Her answer was it was simply a job, and that's, yeah. that's how she looked at it. And she didn't even realize until many 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 years later the the cultural impact of that episode and just how popular and beloved it was and she of course she's happy about that but still in her mind it's just one episode of one show that she did and you know and and i i don't know i'm of two minds about it and you know i feel very similarly to you about the fan questions uh, especially ones about specific episodes and you know i, I think a lot of that stuff kind of it can't even get answered unless it's a an episode that's very dear to the actor or actress's heart that they specifically remember details about because, you know, so it seems like they spin a lot of wheels when people are asking these kinds of questions. And Definitely. yeah, it seems like sometimes it's almost a waste of time and not to insult anybody who asks listener question or, or uh, audience questions in these panels, but uh, it, it, it always seems like we're treading water. And uh, a lot of times, you know, Craig and I will actually leave when they start the Q and a sessions. Yeah, I have done that before for other other people and at other conventions. As a viewer, I have absolutely, I mean, I think everyone has sat there watching an episode of Star Trek or a movie, mm -hmm. and you think, oh my, I would love to ask that actor what they were thinking or if they thought this was goofy or amazing, if they loved it, hated it. But you have to realize that these people, <laughs> they are not intimately familiar with every nuance of Star Trek the way we are. Most of them are not, I would assume, mm -hmm. uh, because they don't sit around rewatching it and talking no. about it incessantly and the, attending conventions from the fan perspective. So, yeah, like I said, there there are there are things that I would really like to ask the actors about, but I know better than to do it. Frankly, a lot of the questions that you hear the actors being asked really should be asked of the writers. Absolutely, that's another another thing that kind of makes me cringe a little bit. And I have certainly heard the actors say, and they're being very polite and nice about it. You know, I don't know. I just read the words on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, if I said something that was, that didn't make sense in the scientific continuity of the episode of yeah. the series, they were just reciting techno babble that was written for them. Exactly. I think if I recall, I, I've heard at least a handful over, over the cons that I've been to between New Jersey and, um, and Vegas. I've heard at least a good handful of Trek actors and actresses say flat out that they don't watch them or they've never watched most of the episodes. Oh, yeah. I think, was it Tim Russ who mentioned that in the Voyager panel that he'd seen a few of them in dubbed into German? <laughs> yeah. Or Rob, no, it was Robert Beltran or somebody mentioned they'd seen the, the most of uh, Voyager that they had ever seen was actually dubbed in another, in another language. And it was while they were on vacation overseas somewhere. That's fascinating. Yeah. So actually now that you, you brought up the Voyager panel, I know that you had been very excited about it and you enjoyed it very much. You want to, I know that was not the same day, but you want to quickly talk about how you liked it and what you liked about it? Sure. Number one, what I liked about it the most was that nobody asked Kate Mulgrew and Jerry Ryan about their supposed onset awkwardness. So <laughs> good job, fan questions. I was really expecting somebody to ask that, and nobody did. Thank you for that, whoever decided to stay in their seats with that question. It was hilarious. It was so much fun seeing them hanging out. Uh, they went right into Q&A, and... Most of the questions were very good. There were a couple of very awkward questions that were just sort of awkward people asking the questions. But uh, the Voyager cast did a great job having fun with it and playing off of the uncomfortableness of some of the questions uh, instead of just sort of standing there quietly blinking. Everybody had great chemistry together. Ethan Phillips, I want Ethan Phillips to be my best friend <laughs> because he is so hilarious. Yeah, I mean, it really just felt like a comedy hour. I on, I mean, and it felt like a very comfortable, natural comedy hour. I don't have anything particularly substantive to say about it, just that it was a ton of, of fun. Yeah, that's funny because the, the final panel of the con on Sunday, uh, which was, was Jonathan Frakes and LeVar Burton and Brent Spiner, was also like a comedy show. And I, I, would, I would love it if they would take that act on the road. I would go see it. That would be great. You know, I didn't see that panel, but I have seen, well, I've seen the three of them together two or three times before, and they're always a lot of fun together. Oh, um, unbelievable. So. 
Unbelievable. Yeah. So that actually is jumping past uh, the rest of Saturday. <laughs> I know. So we're, we're all over the place. Sorry, listeners. Sorry. Um, so on Saturday, Saturday night, if I recall correctly, it is kind of a blur. That was the night that we went to the dessert party. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yes. this could so be a controversial topic. Oh, no, way, no. So. Well, no, no. I Well, I'm just going to talk about the centerpiece. Oh, yeah. Okay. So let's let's get to the centerpiece. I'm, I'm not going to mention Scythe Ride. Okay. You just did. So Well, you can edit it, right? I'm not going to edit that. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I think that there was a lot of protest, and, and Andy Fark of, of Five Year Mission insisted that, that we all go <clears throat> to the dessert party together. So that that's the band, of course, Five Year Mission. Uh, yourself, me. Heather and uh, Heather Barker and um, Jim uh, Morehouse. Mm-hmm. So he insisted that we all go to this dessert party to see uh, the the house band that was playing this year. That's that sci fried band that that uh, Claire just mentioned. And he wanted to see them play an actual show, uh, not not see them just on the stage playing one song and then walking off. So Andy insisted that we go. So we all kind of went, and it was funny because we we wound up sneaking in through a back hall, didn't we? Yeah, I actually was able to – I went through the front because I was a captain's chairperson. But. Right. So, hey, Creation, don't get mad at us. Uh, the band actually got us in. They put us at their table. So Cypheride put us at their own table. Uh, it wasn't uh, wasn't a, a party foul. Oh, you guys came in through – oh, I didn't realize it was – Cypheride that got you in. Yeah. I thought I just assumed it was five year mission, remembered where the back door was from the they, year before. Well, they did. They, they did, but we went back oh. there and found Cypheride backstage and said, Hey guys, you know, we you know, we, we want to check out your show. And they're like, Oh yeah, yeah, come on, sit. So we had they had a table set aside for anybody that Cypheride want to invite in. So that's oh, where we got well, that, set. That's really nice. I did yeah. not realize that part. I yes. didn't know that. Yes, and that's where you built you and, and Andy and the rest of us built that lovely centerpiece yes. for the centerpiece contest that we didn't know beforehand existed so i knew that the centerpiece contest I existed i have mm-hmm. never of course made an entry until that night <laughs> it's not something that i have really paid much attention to i just you know you see it on the convention site and you, and you know scroll past it as you're looking for updates in the in the months and weeks prior to the convention mm. apparently it's a pretty big deal they do give away i think it's a 300 hundred dollar gift certificate wow. for the vendor's room i believe Jeez. it's it's not or 500 maybe wow. it's not small i know wow. when people will set up their centerpieces that i believe tend to be star trek or science fiction related i have never actually walked around and looked at other people's centerpieces but what happened was a thing of beauty it was gorgeous. So, so I had a couple of props with me as part of my cosplay for that day. Um, I made the headset for the game, the TNG episode, the game. And I also had a kind of a generic TNG era sort of carry case, one of those plastic cases that they always carry their tools around in. Uh, and then there was there was a, a camera on one of those little tripod things, and there was a sweat band. There was just a lot of very disparate stuff that we piled into the middle of the table (laughs) precariously balanced in a position (laughs) and we joked we did not expect anyone to actually do this but we joked that hey there's our centerpiece and lo and behold people lots of people i would say 10 or 15 different people walked by with (laughs) a very scrutinizing look on their face just sort of quietly looked at it and we realized that people thought this was actually our entry into the centerpiece contest, and it was it was amazing. People were looking from other tables and giving yeah, us the stink eye because it was such crap. Was... <laughs> and we had someone take photographs of it with his iPad. The official like... photographer, right? He was coming around taking oh, pictures of everybody yeah. for the contest, and he was like. He was like Federico Fellini. He's doing like low angle zooms. <laughs> he totally was. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and I mean, we actually had someone come, uh, a judge, I assume, ask us to explain what it meant. <laughs> I, I, it was honestly, it was like a, a fantasy come true because that's the kind of thing I always think about. How great would it be to do this? And wouldn't it be funny if people reacted this way? And it actually happened. I, I never thought that would happen. Didn't we explain it as something like um, uh, rage against the state of our our, our digital yes. lives and, and uh, angst over yes. over our, our fixation on, on technology and, and constant communication? 
which it yes. had nothing to do with, but no, it just was the it was what we happened to have at our disposal to to pile up in the middle of this table. Oh god. It was it was incredible. Thanks for reminding me of that. I'd almost forgotten. Oh no, never forget. Never no, forget. That was a, that was fun. <laughs> that was that was really yeah. fun. So we didn't wind up staying all too long. I think we stayed for a handful of songs. Mm-hmm. And then we went back to guess where? Masquerade, the masquerade? Bar. Yeah. Every night. Yeah. Every night. So if you want to find us, people, if you're going to the con and you want to find us at night, that's where you're going to find us. Yes. We will be there. And even if you're someone who doesn't drink a lot or doesn't usually go to bars, go to the masquerade at least once because it's oh. it's a bar full of people in Star Trek costumes and there's Klingons. It's not your typical bar experience that you might have in your regular life. It's not at all. Not at all. So actually, that's a good point because uh, another guest that's going to be on this episode a little while later is our friend Donnie Versaja, who's been on a couple shows with us prior. He's a digital artist. Uh, he does 3D art. He does ship interiors uh, for a, of a bunch of different ships. And uh, he's he's a really fantastic guy, and he doesn't drink. And he was hanging out at Masquerade, and I saw him there a few times. And it doesn't matter if you're not a party person or you are a party person. You're going to get into a great conversation while you're there. So yeah. uh, so just, just, just give it a shot. So, so that brings us to Sunday. And Sunday actually was was our long day. I wound up running into you guys pretty early on uh, in the hall. Yeah. Sunday was, for me, it was a nice casual day. I it didn't was. wear a costume because I just wanted to wear jeans. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Let's see. What happened? So we did Brian Sunday? Fuller. Oh, that's right. Of course. How can I forget? Yes. I was really excited months and months ago when Brian Fuller was announced uh, as someone who was going to be attending the convention. I, a big fan of his outside of Star Trek, as well as within Star Trek. I think he's responsible for creating some of the most interesting Voyager episodes and, you know, whether they're serious or they're kind of goofy. I mean, he, he's responsible for Captain Proton. And so for that alone, he should be applauded in my opinion. I don't know how anyone can dislike Captain Proton, but that's just me. <laughs> so that was wonderful. So then we, yeah, I think we broke for lunch after. And we, we went did. to that hash house that I've always wanted to go to, but I never went to. It was my first time there. Yes, the hash house, the infamous gigantic portions hash house. Yeah, I don't understand how anybody who is, I mean, even if you're staying there, what do you do with all that extra food? You take it back up to your room you, and put it in the fridge? No, I'm convinced that 50% of the food they prepare gets thrown away, which bugs to. me. It's um, got to. I had the smallest yeah. thing I could find on the menu, and I couldn't eat it all. So The I, only day that I managed to eat my entire meal there, and I ate there three times, was the wow. day I got a salad. Oh, that was the day we and went? Even, yeah, I mean, it was a big salad, but I didn't eat the roll, which looked like it was made of Neutron Star. I mean, it looked super dense. Oh, God, they were like boulders. <laughs> they, yeah, they looked like it. But no, I mean, I it honestly kind of bothers me that the gimmick of gigantic portions turns into like massive waste of food. But that's a whole different issue. That's a whole other it's, podcast. It, yeah, it doesn't stop me from eating there because the food options are so limited. So Stop bringing up whatever. ideas for more podcasts, Claire. Yeah. Stop doing that. <laughs> we don't have time. Claire gets enraged about something, but it doesn't stop her from doing it anyway. Ranting and raving, Claire. So there's a little taste of what you're in for, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) down the road. Uh, So what happened? Uh, So Patrick Stewart was a little later in the day. Yeah, that that panel was just spectacular. And he he did do a little bit of plugging, or well, rather a lot of plugging for uh, his new show. Blunt talk, talk, blunt talk. Yeah, and I'd seen a trailer for it, and it's it's with Seth. He's doing it with Seth MacFarlane, which I'm a big Seth MacFarlane fan. I I really enjoy his work. I've been a Family Guy fan for a lot of years. I do like American Dad and the the Ted films. Which actually, people, if if you're a fan of Michael Dorn and you have not seen Ted Two, you owe it to yourself (laughs) to see Ted Two because you will see Michael Dorn in the crappiest Klingon cosplay costume at a comic con at the end of the movie and it is priceless. Siri, okay, I haven't seen it, but I will at the very least you be looking watching that one scene. I'll I'll watch the whole thing, but I might have to spoil it for myself and just see that right now. Okay, you, you really need to watch it because it cracked me as a Star Trek fan. It really cracked me up to see him <laughs> lampooning his own role. <laughs> and, and it's it's great. It's great. So he's actually I don't, I'm not going to ruin it for you. I'm not going to ruin it for you. So if okay. you haven't seen it, go see it. So anyway, Patrick Stewart panel. So it, there was a lot of talk about um, his new show, which which I think looks really good. I, I'm not sure how you feel about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it 
it honestly it kind of reminded me of the Ricky Gervais. Yes. Um, just because it's, it's live action, so it's not something that you immediately associate with Seth MacFarlane. There's <laughs> nothing, no, no uh, animate animals that shouldn't normally be animate. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it feels more like uh, a Ricky Gervais style kind of, I guess, a black comedy. I mean, it seems like again, it mixes serious themes with ridiculous humor. Yes. Um, it's kind of what it seems to me like. I haven't actually seen any full episodes of it though. Yeah, it's 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 due to come out pretty soon. There's a couple of long trailers that are available, and mm-hmm. uh, I guess he plays a is he some sort of a newsman uh, who falls from grace. Right, formerly very well respected or at least famous. I don't mm-hmm. know if he's. I guess you can be famous without being well respected. True. But yes, at the very least, a famous newsman. Yeah, and he gets busted for something or other, and gets arrested, and winds up being shamed publicly and this is the this is the rest of his life after i think that's like the first episode and this is everything that happens to him afterwards and i i thought it was actually kind of brilliant uh, it looked yeah, pretty think, interesting to me i'm, I'm willing to give yeah. it and he said didn't he say they got they, he got a 20 episode order yeah it's actually two seasons that's they amazing. all they went from zero to two full seasons that's amazing well i guess there must be something to it then so i'm gonna have to Definitely. keep my eyes out for it but one thing that really fascinated me at, on the patrick stewart panel and i think yeah, I remember, if I remember correctly, I looked over uh, toward you and, and Heather, who was also with us, and it really, really got to you guys. And that was when uh, an audience member asked about Patrick Stewart's work with the Violence Against Women Charity Refuge. And uh, if anybody doesn't know about that, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It, it, it helps so many, so many battered women to find places to stay in safe houses and gives them resources to get their lives back on track. And he's been part of that for a very long time. And you guys were very, very impacted by that. I really appreciated his comment that it's a man, uh, it's not a, just a women's issue, that it's a man's issue and a women's issue. It's it's an issue that has to be addressed equally by, by everybody. Agreed. Um, I thought that was really meaningful. And I knew that he was involved with that charity. And I knew that some about his, his childhood experiences with domestic violence. And I knew that he, I, I, when I say he enjoys talking about it, that's not really the right word, but that he appreciates being able to t- talk about it. So I also, I was kind of hoping somebody might ask about his work with, um, I don't know the name of the charity, but he's, I believe he's very interested in the sort of right to die campaign as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Not, not to drag this podcast down into depressing areas, but, um, well, as you, as the audience can tell, if, if you, you weren't there and you didn't hear, there was Patrick was equal parts, Star Trek, and comedy along with real talk and and uh, oh yeah i i thought that was very refreshing actually that you know he would come up there and and talk to the audience about things that are happening in real life and and serious issues and and not just uh, joke around about star trek for an hour well and and the person who followed up uh the question which became a, a nice sort of i think it's probably a five or six minute response about domestic violence the next person to ask a question had a question about Star Trek. I don't remember what the question was, but it was not a serious question. But Patrick Stewart was equally invested in answering mm-hmm. that question as he was the other person's. I thought that was really nice. For a moment, I felt kind of bad for the guy that was following the yeah. serious question because how do you follow, follow that? Yeah, exactly. But Patrick Stewart seemed to make him very comfortable and, and did not dismiss a sort of less serious question after having answered a very serious one. So I thought that was really great. It was excellent. Excellent. It was an excellent panel. So it was. I, I had never actually seen Patrick Stewart before. I had somehow managed always to attend conventions that he was not attending. Yeah. <laughs> so I was really happy to finally get to see him and to have it be such a great panel. Yeah, I've only ever attended one convention that Patrick Stewart was at, and the cost was so prohibitive to get into the area where he was. I didn't even bother. Uh, oh, it was a convention here in New Jersey. And it was actually a horror convention strangely enough and hmm. he was in his own separate room so the the price of admission didn't get you into his separate room you had to pay extra money just to get into his room and that didn't include a photo or an autograph you had to pay separate for that too that's like, bizarre yeah well new jersey we're weird with conventions but anyway we're digressing away from <laughs> the vegas convention we can i'm sure we can find room to talk about this at some point but yeah creations cons are much different than the cons we have here uh, in new jersey so so since we are running a little long, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about any of your other memories that we haven't already touched on about the con. Well, there's something that I think you'll hear a lot of people say, whether they're 
you know, on this podcast or just anyone who's attended any one of these conventions. And it's, people say it all the time, but it's totally true. And it's that you go to these conventions first and foremost for the the people. And I don't mean the celebrities on stage. I mean, the people that you meet, the yes. friends that you make. Um, totally true. It's really cliche to say it. And I think that people who've never been to one of these conventions, who maybe aren't really part of uh, any fandom, whether it's Star Trek or something else, they might kind of brush it off like, yeah, yeah, meeting people's nice. I don't think they realize just how incredible and meaningful it can be to walk into a room full of strangers and know that they're really not strangers because you have some shared interest that you can immediately start talking about and immediately have a conversation with them. You know, it's it's silly, but it's that's what really gets me excited about going to these, you know, um, these conventions can be really exhausting. Mm -hmm. You stay up late and it's fun to stay up late, but ooh, in the morning, <laughs> maybe you wish you hadn't, but then you do it again the next night. Exactly. It can be kind of, you know, you stop and think I could be home right now. And that sounds pretty appealing sometimes, mm -hmm. but when it's over, the you just want to go back again because you want to be able to hang out with your friends and have crazy fun experiences and do things that for me anyway, are not part of my normal everyday life. And it's, it's like one week a year that you can just sort of totally let loose and have fun. So yeah, that's the best part of these. More. I could not agree more. And actually, if I recall correctly, Mr. Shatner himself uh, pointed that out mm -hmm. on stage when he was talking about his get a life documentary and book yeah. that he has discovered that that is the secret sauce of Star Trek Absolutely. conventions has nothing really yeah. to do with the, the with the celebs or the mm -hmm. panels. I mean, they're all ancillary. And, you know, this year, not to get uh, too deep into the weeds because you, you just went through this, but I came out this year. This was my second Vegas Trek convention. Last year was my first one. And last year was all about photo ops and panels mm -hmm. and the vendor room and all that stuff. This year for me was 99% about the people. And I started to realize that about halfway through. Yeah. Because I was spent got to spend so much time with five year mission because they weren't the house band this year. I got to spend so many so many hours and hours and hours with them, which is what I really wanted to do. And then I met so many great new friends this year. I, I feel like I've got uh, at least a good handful of people that I'm going to keep in touch with all year long until next con comes. Oh, and absolutely. That I is mean, worth the price of admission 10 times over. Yeah. I mean, the first year that I went to the Vegas convention, I went by myself knowing that I would run into people that I could have conversations with and, and whose company I would enjoy. And I kid you not, while I was waiting in the registration line, you know, within 20 minutes of arriving at the Rio, this woman struck up a conversation with me and it was Heather Barker. And mm -hmm. this year we ended up staying in our hotel room together. We're really good friends. And it just sort of, that's the magic of the convention. It really is. And, you know, it's funny. I had briefly met Heather last year uh, because she was the moderator of that Facebook, the unofficial Facebook group mm -hmm. for the con. And I had seen her for, you know, maybe two or three minutes, but we didn't really have much of a chance to talk. I mean, this year was totally different. And yeah. she's one of those people that's in that handful that uh, yeah. I'm sure that I'm going to be talking to all year round. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And it's something that occurred to me, and I've said this uh, in, in conversations with people outside this podcast, but and it's, it's really funny to think about this, but it's so true that uh, it seems like everybody that I met was like an instantaneous friend. Everybody. Mm -hmm. So strange because that's not the way real life works. It, exactly. I know. I, I, and it's kind of jarring when you come back home. It's, it surprises me how quickly I get comfortable in that role mm -hmm. of, frankly, kind of a social butterfly, which is absolutely not how I normally am. <laughs> it surprises me that how quickly I become that and then how suddenly I'm like whoa I'm I'm not that anymore and it's for a few days I'm just, I was thinking about this earlier today it feels kind of weird being my usual self it does doesn't it, <laughs> it yeah does. that that the uh, STLV blues I do I yeah, do I do too so well I we've been talking for almost an hour now I think uh, maybe okay. <laughs> well wow. uh, all right is amazing huh so maybe yeah. we'll uh, we'll wrap it. Is there anything else that you want to throw out there uh, before we wrap up? Not really. I mean, just if anybody's thinking about going to one of these, especially if you're thinking about going by yourself and you don't want to go because you think going by yourself won't be fun or it'll be awkward, hmm. don't let that stop you because it won't be awkward and you will have fun. Absolutely true. I agree completely. So 
Claire Little, it has been yes. awesome having you on the show for the first time. Thank you so much. And I am very, very much looking forward to starting up our new series together uh, in the very yes. near future. Uh, everybody out there, look for that coming up pretty soon. I don't think it's going to take too long to get the first episode out. I think we're both very enthusiastic. So that's about it. So stay tuned. Our next interview is coming up in a few seconds. Claire, once again, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. We're back with our second interview of the show. And we have with us Andy Fark and Mike Rittenhouse from Five Year Mission. How's it going, dudes? Fantastic. Awesome. Andy, what's wrong with your voice? I'm study. I'm an understudy in the new uh, K- uh, Kathleen Turner bi- biopic. Oh, I was thought you were going to say the third installment in the uh, Romancing the Stone Jewel of the Nile series. I only wish you could kiss Michael Douglas. Uh, nah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. All right. So we all just kind of got back uh, from the Vegas con. That was a week ago today, actually. Uh, we were all there together, and uh, I think the big difference for you guys this year, of course, is that you were the house band last year, and you weren't the house band this year. So I, one thing I was wondering is, do you guys prefer being the house band or being more accessible and, and being in the vendor room? Both have their their pros and cons. Yeah, definitely. I mean, last year, being the house band was awesome just because, you know, being in front of all those people and, you know, playing the stars on and off the stage and then um, getting to interact with the stars. Right. That was really awesome. This year, we actually got to hang out and actually talk to fans instead of, you know, being on stage the entire time or, you know, if we're at our merch booth, we're rushing back to the stage. So uh, if only there was a way to have the best of both worlds on that. Yeah. Mm, that's a sh- Yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. You know, one thing I, I noticed, though, is that last year when you guys were the house band, you were on stage a lot, you know, between panels, you were playing a couple tunes here and there. So you were pretty much playing all day long, but this year they seemed to work the house band a little differently. They weren't really playing much between panels. They got a lot more off time uh, than you guys did last year. Yeah. I noticed that too. Yeah. I wonder if, if you guys were the house band again next year, if they would modify the way that uh, they had you playing. So remember you were telling me, that they kind of were flying by the seat of their pants that year that you were the house band. They didn't know exactly what they were doing, so they were kind of just telling you to get up on stage and play something. Right, right, right. And I know um, Mike, I think it was Mike, I think it was me and you, went in for the Takei panel, uh, just the beginning at least, and I know there was like a lot of lag between the Delancey panel and the Takei panel. It's just It was just silence, and they were playing like the themes and stuff over the loudspeakers, and I was like, getting kind of annoyed myself because i know i'm i'm a really impatient person i'm like man what is go- what is taking so long oh, they should be have something going on and i was like oh wait that's what we were doing last year yeah you were filling the gaps yeah yep. yeah gross yeah. yeah i wonder i wonder what the reasoning behind that was but um i don't i don't know and I, I never i never really got a chance to uh hang out and talk with uh sci fried this year's house band uh to find out what the deal was with that if like they because I, I I thought they did it on the first day, but then it seemed to just kind of diminish as like the weekend went on. So I never really got like a clear answer on why that was. Yeah, I don't think any of us did. But one thing that that was I found really interesting about it was that it wasn't you guys that were doing it, but I got the impression that your supporters at the convention were kind of creating an air of competition between you and 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 side fried and I know, I know you guys didn't see yourselves as in competition with them but i know there were a lot of your fans who were wishing that you were on the stage yeah i mean we were i just like like i said being at our booth we were able to talk to a lot more people um so we had a, a really good <laughs> hundreds of people coming up and saying hey well, why aren't you guys up there this year and we're like hey we're not even sure ourselves, so uh, you know, talk to Creation, see if it's, see if you can convince them to let us do it again. So, uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, n- n- no competition between us and Sci Fried whatsoever. No bad blood or anything like that. They were super duper nice guys. They did, they did a great job preparing for it. I thought, um, at least what I saw. I didn't really get all that much feedback about what they did, so I'm not sure. I'm gonna let Mike talk because my voice is going. <laughs> well, we we received 
a lot of feedback about the house band over the weekend. Even though we weren't the house band, I think because, since we were the year before, people felt like we were someone that they could come to. And, like a sounding board. Yeah, so I mean, we, we did receive a lot of feedback about that. Most of it was that people uh, really liked us from the year before and were hoping to see us up there again. So, yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I mean, all we can really do is just encourage people to mention that to creation. Yeah, somebody actually started a campaign over on Twitter and Facebook, the hashtag 5YMSTLV2016. Uh, so, like, they're encouraging everyone to email uh, guests at creation dot 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 com and uh, using that hashtag and tweeting at Creation Entertainment and then also uh, writing on Creation's Facebook wall. Um, <clears throat> that was just kind of a big surprise to us. And I was like, hey, more power to you. I mean, yeah. more voices in our corner, you well, know. I, I've already thrown my, uh, my digital hat in that ring, and I will be throwing it in periodically throughout the year. Well, now, and, now what, what are you going to do without a hat? Well, you know what? I'll just have to go cold without my chapeau, but you guys are worth it. Chapeau. You guys are worth it. You French bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I was going to mention that uh, that new campaign – uh, that were started up by some of your fans, and there is a Facebook page. I'll put that link uh, in the show notes for this, so that you can uh, you can check that out for yourself. Is right now it's kind of like a a five year mission fan uh, love fest in there. Yeah, I've noticed that. It's a lot of butterflies and rainbows and hearts. Nothing wrong with that. No, it's 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 a whole bunch of five year mission love. So if you love five year mission, you got to get in on that page and 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 join the uh, the circle. <laughs> I didn't throw the extra word on there. Uh, so um see jeff this is this is why i love you oh well we i i love you guys too you guys are the best man i'm gonna get into how much i love you guys near the end so in case i start crying uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah you you don't you don't want to you don't want to do that more than once and no. then, so save it no i don't want to break down twice in a show it kind of loses its, its impact so <laughs> yeah. i feel it seems insincere right so <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, uh, you guys also, uh, since you weren't the house band, you did still play two shows, right? You played the gold yeah. ticket or whatever they call that, the gold circle, and and then the captain's chair. The captain's chair I happen to be at, but uh, you're welcome. Those, yes, I appreciate. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> uh, there, the two shows. I mean, were, do you guys were they equal in your minds, or was one different than the other? Were the set lists reasonably the same, or did you switch it up? How did how were they both played out? The set lists were very similar. We swapped out a few songs uh, between the first night and the second night, but the crowds were actually quite different. The On uh, Thursday night at the Gold Party, it was a very quiet crowd. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, with like a, like a few exceptions. Yeah, I mean, night. but yeah, it, 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 we, we would finish the song and, and there would be silence. Crickets. Wow. And, and and then Andy would even say something to the to the audience. He, he'd be like, "How's everybody enjoying their food tonight?" And then yeah. silence. <laughs> like, oh, well, I guess all your mouths are full. So and, I'll take that as a yum. Oh man. And, and, you know, we we got the impression that they just didn't care or didn't want us there or or something. But I'll, I'll tell you what. Throughout the weekend, enough people came up to me and and said that they really enjoyed our show on Thursday night. Yeah. That. Oh, that's I, great. I guess they enjoyed it. Uh, maybe they just didn't understand how to react. To yeah, it. I think I think I think a lot of people, I, actually, at both Captain's Chair and Gold Parties, um, just weren't really used to live like live music settings, so they weren't quite sure how to react. Hmm. So I I, I think that might have been an issue, but That's what uh, I thought. Uh, like like Mike said, we got enough feedback at our booth like throughout the weekend, which yet again, nice thing about not being the house band. We get all this feedback like directly, hmm. so I mean we got a lot of really good feedback. Like, yeah, I saw you at the gold party. I saw you at the captain's chair party. Oh, you were awesome. Let me let me buy one of everything that you have here. <laughs> so speaking of the captain's chair party, the one that I was in attendance for, and and Craig was also in attendance for, uh, I, I want to thank you guys publicly for for dedicating a song to us. Which uh, one did we dedicate? Oh, I forgot. It was I Mud actually. Which ones are Craig and Jeff? Oh, wrong podcast. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Were they the hot girls? Did you yeah. think you were on a different show? Yeah, we I get th that all the time. 
I thought I thought I thought we were we were on the GNT show. Sorry. Oh man. So yes, Patrick dedicated uh, iMud to us. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I must have cool. been not paying any attention. Yeah, because earlier in the day we were talking about uh, what you what you guys were gonna play, and I uh, asked if iMud was gonna be in the set, and of course, it was. That's a pretty much a, cl- a crowd pleaser. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, no shock that it was in there, but always enjoy hearing that one live. So I think I sang myself hoarse that night. You did. Yeah, as did Jim Morehouse. Oh my <laughs> God, I love Jim Morehouse so much. Uh, his what? dancing was great. Yes. Oh. Uh, that that was one of the highlights of the weekend for me. All I have to do is think about him doing that dance, and I smile so big to myself. Me too. It's the thing ever. I just I was just talking to Claire earlier about this, and she. She said that she had thought that he was going to, in the middle of one of his dances, grab a hold of that hunk of meat that was on the carving station and just start tearing <laughs> it apart with his teeth <laughs> while he was dancing. So I could just see him doing that. He's that kind of crazy, wacky guy. Yeah. yeah. I was I, I was hoping for something like that. He'd start, like, juggling the Swedish meatballs or something. <laughs> so between those two shows, do you guys have any particular uh, special recollections or memories of those? Really just being able to go out on that roof after the awesome. show, hang out, uh, yeah. 51 stories up on top of the Rio, oh, the whole Vegas skyline lit up, that nice, cool breeze, mm. especially after being on that hot-ass stage, oh my god, and just hanging out with everybody, singing 80s metal songs at the top of our lungs. And Wasn't that great? It was awesome. Um, One highlight for me was after the show on Thursday when we went out onto the roof watching all of the uh, older fans especially the female ones kind of flock around Chris oh yeah. <laughs> that's not unusual almost any show yeah yeah but it it was entertaining that they were all much older than he is yeah yeah and you usually usually you know if 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 it happens it's it's girls more around his age but this was pretty entertaining. I got I got to dance with one of them. Yes, oh. for ten seconds, and then I and then and then I was the one that stopped because I was way too white to continue. <laughs> Is Chris like the George Clooney of the group? Yes, that's a pretty accurate. Uh, yeah, kind of. He's he's he he just turned forty, so he's slowly making his way into like like the whole level of Silver Fox. <laughs> He, he is going to love that I said that. <laughs> well, isn't that the dream? Pretty much, yeah. Isn't that the men's dream? Yeah. Right. So let's let's jump over to Spock's brain, of course. The album is still new. It, it's still fresh. And this con was the first con that it was – well, the first Trek con that it was sold at, right? So what was the general reaction from the, the fans at the con about the Spock's brain album? They've been loving it. I mean, we sold a ton of copies while we were there. People are like, "Well, last year when I was here, I bought everything you had." And of course, you know, we have to kind of, kind of make them laugh or take them off guard and be like, "Well, you don't have this yet." <laughs> They're like, "Ooh, what's this?" So then we had to school them on what it was. Or some people just came up and were like, "Yeah, I need your new album." And I'm like, "Well, okay, you're the easiest sale I'm gonna have today, so here you go." <laughs> so the, the 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 reputation kind of kind of preceded it and. Uh, obviously people have been following us on Facebook and Twitter and our website and everything and or you know might have thought about backing the Kickstarter but you know couldn't afford to at the time so they kind of had to wait so so that was nice that like a lot of people and plus the songs that we did at the Golden Captain's Cheers and Chair Parties those all went over really really well I was surprised at the number of people that bought it and then came back the next day and had already listened to it yeah wow. it's- who has a CD player in their hotel room? Yeah. Who has the time to listen to an album while yeah. you're at STLV? Or well, I guess like that. Yeah. Maybe but. they stuck it in their room DVD players and played it through the TV set. May- the, maybe. I don't did, know. Did the rooms have DVD players? I'm, I'm sure they, they did. Yeah. I'm sure there's something. Maybe maybe they did. We may, Maybe we just weren't in the room yeah, enough. Yeah, we, we weren't in the room enough to know this stuff. Uh, we had our TV on once. Yeah, and we watched Kino and one of four Korean channels. Wow. Tried to find an episode of Friends, but no friends on this trip. To, I know. To Mike and I's disappointment. So I, I, you just made reference to the live songs that you played from Spock's brand. And can I tell you how much R.C. Spock rocks live? 
<laughs> that is the one that kills me at every show. Oh, it's so much fun. It's like a jump up and down song. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, any, any specific fan feedback you can remember about the Spock's Brain album or any of the songs live? According to Morehouse, <laughs> uh, remote control Spock brings down the house. I can is see that. that. <laughs> In quotes, brings down the house. Yeah, nice. he said that's a showstopper. I think I probably jumped up and down through the entire track when you were playing it. I can't remember which party it was, but uh, we played uh, For His Head Is Hollow and I've Touched Spock's Brain, the one that we have the video for out currently. Uh, at, the, at the end of the show, I was like, all right, we got two left. And some guy towards the front of the stage was like, play Spock's Brain again. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, no, that's not how that's not how encores work. So. What is this a Europe show? Yeah, I know. Open and close at the final countdown. You not open and close <laughs> the final countdown. You close right the final countdown. Well, you got to admit the beginning of it sounds good at the at the beginning of a show though. Yeah, that you play it second to last because then it's the final yeah. countdown. The last well, time. And then and then you end on Cherokee. So sometimes <laughs> sometimes you you can you can reprise something. There's the reprise. We have a Tribbles reprise, that's true, but oh. we haven't played that in a long, long time. That would actually be, be kind of funny to do at some show. Play that one again! Which one? This one? And then just go through the long, <laughs> drawn-out reprise. So I'm expecting my typical Andy Fark answer to this next question. I, I must have gotten this from you at least 50 times throughout the convention as you told me to where to go. But <laughs> I'm going to throw out the most dreaded question uh, that a band usually gets after they put out a record. It's, <laughs> what are you guys doing next? Don't you know the answer to this by now? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I know. You you know the answer. You, hey, just, give you us, just want us to re reiterate it to the new people. Come on, Jeff, give us your best five year mission impression. Answer it for us. Yeah. I can't. This is a family show. I oh, can't drop well, that uh, bomb. Well, the, the the only person you have to worry about doing an impression of is me and my potty mouth. All right, hold it, on. It, Hang on. All right. I yeah. want to hear right. I want to hear your best Fark impersonation. Usual Fark, not Kathleen Turner sultry. I'm going to have phone sex with you Fark. Oh man, I don't I don't I, I don't know if I can get the voice right, but I'll give it a shot. And I may have to bleep it, but All Okay. Right. <laughs> Jeff. Oh, actually actually please do just curse your head off and then bleep it cuz that'd be amazing. Well, you usually don't yell out that part. You usually is very you're very calm when you deliver that. It's That's the dramatic pause where you stare at me after you say my name several times in a row and you stare at me waiting for my reaction. And then when I go to open my mouth, that's when you say it. Okay. Okay. So usually you, you, and you have this, you, you kind of look partially up in the air and down at me at the same time. And you get yeah. this whole Jeff, Jeff, like, all right, Andy, lay it on me. Come on. I know what's coming. You're like, I love the name. how did you whisper it? Because you've done that to me so many times. That's true. That's true. Well, because there were children around. Right. So there's children around, right? Mike's here. Oh, that's a... So the official que the official answer to the question, what's next, just so the audience knows. Are you saying what are we doing after Spock's brain? Yes. Oh, after Spock's brain? Oh, we're yeah. going to start working on year four. Yay. We already have, uh, what, like eight or nine demos? Get out. Yeah, it's about half. Something like that. Yeah, so like half the album is written. Wow. Uh, we haven't really practiced any of the songs yet or anything like that, but the demos that we have so far are sounding really promising. <laughs> and uh, well, like a, a lot of the feedback that we've been getting off of Spock's brain is like, oh, it's the, the, the best thing you guys have put out so far. And, you know, thank you. But with the way year four is shaping up, I mean, year four is, I mean, just going to be that much better, if not equal, because I don't want to get anyone's hopes up. Yeah. Well, I think I think the quality of of the outputs just it's been very consistent all throughout. But I I think there's been some maybe some advances in the way that you guys record and the way that you mix that make it sound a little bit different, right? We've been we've been kind of climbing a little musical ladder since yeah. we started. We've learned a few lessons here and there, and we've expanded into a couple of genres that we didn't do in the yeah. beginning. And, and and it seems like <clears throat> like songwriting wise, and, and nobody's really like holding back anymore everyone seems to kind of found like their particular strong spots it's like mm. well i'd like to write a song in this style but the last time i wrote one in this style it worked really really well so i want to kind of you know move on see how much more i can do with this certain 
genre that I'm going for. Like I, I, th- I think especially Chris has come a really long way with his with his songwriting. Uh, Noah just keeps on bringing it and bringing it. Uh, Patrick has gotten a little more uh, bombastic. Mm-hmm. I guess would be the word for it. He's gotten a lot more hooky. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying his early songs didn't have good hooks or anything like that, but I think they've just come like leaps and bounds, a little more sing alongy and stuff like that. And uh, Mike can sing now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and, Andy. And I can sing now. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe we'll have a fart bonus track on year four. You never know. Yeah. You like Ringo. Damn straight. If we get one pity song for album. That's right. That's God. right. I was just kidding. That's one of the things I love about you guys, though, is you all contribute. So, I mean, it's, it's not yeah. just a, one or two people doing all the writing. Everybody else is just there. You guys all really throw in and come up with great stuff. So, so anyway, back to the con since we've, yes. since we've digressed so much. Man. Uh, so Andy, I, I think that it was you, if I recall correctly, I believe that it was you that put forth the theory that the uh, the guy that was in the Shatner and Takei panels who incited the the battle between the two of them or brought it back into the into the con by asking each one of them about each other, and I think you were the one that came up with the theory that it was a it was a plant to oh, yeah. stir up the pot for the next year's con. Yeah, because uh, what 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 was what was the question that that was asked of Shatner first? It was like, oh, so are you gonna are you gonna ever bur- like bury, bury the, hatchet the hatchet with George? It was bury the hatchet. Yep. And then Shatner's response was like, "What in his head?" And he's like, "No, I, I just don't really know George as a person." Blah blah blah. And then t- then to Kay got asked pretty much the same thing. He's like, "I don't really know uh, you as a person all that much." You know. It's the best to Kay I can do with the voice, <laughs> but yeah. I swear that guy was either a plant or dumb. One of the two was like, "Oh, let's see, let's see if I can get these two arguing back and forth on Twitter." I think he was a plant. Says it's the fiftieth next year, and then they're going to end up doing a TOS cast, like surviving cast member panel, mm-hmm. and that's where it's all going to kind of culminate, and they'll come out and either hug or one of them will have like an actual fake hatchet or something stupid like that. Yeah, you know that's it's a it's an interesting thought because. If you if you're familiar with the logistics of panels at these giant conventions and how early you need to get online in order to even get a chance to get a question in for the same person to get to the front of the line on two of the biggest panels at the con, that's yeah. tough to do. Exactly. Very tough to do. Which is why I think that guy, uh, like I said, he was either a plant or an idiot. One of the two. Hmm. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm kind of. What do. You, what do you think, Mike? I totally think it's a plant. If you listen to their responses, each of them, they sound almost rehearsed. They, yeah, agreed. Like it, like you can tell when, like I, I've seen Shatner speak a few times, and I've I've seen Takay. I mean, both of them I've seen like on a recording, but I've seen them live also. And I mean, you can tell when they're coming up with stuff on the fly. Yeah. And both of their responses to that seemed very planned out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they did seem very well rehearsed. Now that I think back on it, all right. So our the the opinion now between uh, between us is all that, that it's a plant. Uh, I I, think so. I really think so. Okay, so we'll see how it plays out next year. And if if any of the fans or or listeners who are listening to this have an opinion of their own, please share it with us. We'd love to hear it. So uh, share it with either our show or or Five Year Mission, and we'll get it that way. So. Uh, Guys, uh, any any con memories that you want to bring up that we haven't talked about already? I mean, you guys were in the vendor room a lot of times, but I know you got out to to run around a bit. There's so much stuff. I mean, it, it, every every few minutes, I, I'll think back about the weekend, and I'll remember something else that I've forgotten already. <laughs> there was just so much stuff going on. Yeah, um, my absolute favorite memory. Uh, Outside of obviously getting to hang out with everybody like Heather and Claire, Jim, every I all all those guys. This um, Jeff, this, guy, yeah, this we keep Jeff talking guy, about. I don't know. Basically, basically anybody that wound up at the masquerade bar at the end of the night was just so fun. Brian Knack. Oh, he's a great guy. He was awesome to get to get to hang out with a little more. My absolute favorite memory was on the final night of the con. Initially, earlier in the day. Uh, we've, we, 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 we were actually Max Grodenchek's backing band when they, when he, uh, mm-hmm. when he was a guest 
here in Indy at Starbase Indy. And so he remembered us. So we had gone up to his table a couple times throughout the weekend, just kind of hung out and talked. And I, my favorite thing to do is just to mess around with Max and Aaron Eisenberg, too, because they're both just hilarious. And Max is just this kind of acts like a cranky old man, but he's really funny. And uh, normally I could do his voice. I'll, I'll try to do it once I get to that part. But earlier on in the day, he decided that he would he really needed our help for editing some music for the, for the Rat Pack show later. And he started explaining it to me, and so I went and got Mike. And he starts explaining it to Mike, starts going way too into detail, starts like writing <laughs> writing out sheet music and, and yeah. inside a notebook. Tre- like a, all, treble clefs and everything. All he had to do was say, I need you to add two beats into a song. I would have yeah. understood perfectly what he was t- talking about. But then he, he just <laughs> faded out, add two beats, fade it back in, you're good. But no, he made it super duper complicated. And we were like, yeah, we can help you out. Just find us. We'll be at our booth. And then he comes back later and he was like, oh, no, I, I we took, I, wait, I'm going try to try, try to do the max voice for all this. No, 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 no. We took, we, we took care of it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you a shout if I need anything else. And we were like, okay, that's cool, Max, whatever. Your, your Kathleen Turner Max sounds British. A little bit, hmm. a little bit. Not, not really do. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing my best over here. So later on that night, you know, we, the, the vendor room closes up, and I go up, take a shower. Jeff, got to, Jeff and Greg got, got to watch me undress. So it was, that was pretty awesome. And he wears boxers, ladies, in case you're wondering. That was a highlight of the weekend, too. But uh, a few of us are down sitting in the masquerade bar. We were going go to go to the Rat Pack show. Oh, and yes. He, and uh, they started asking me. They were like, so what, whatever happened to helping out Max with the Rat Pack thing? And I was like, oh, no, he, he came by our booth and said he didn't need help. Literally 10 seconds later, yep. my phone rings. And it's, uh, uh, it's an unknown, unknown call from like Orange County, California or something. I'm like, I don't answer unknown numbers. But then I started thinking. I was like, wait a second. I remember Max Grodenchik putting his my number into his flip phone earlier in the day. Uh-huh. Yes. Max Groden Chick's flip phone, ladies and gentlemen. And so I was like, oh, shit, I better answer this. And so I pick up the phone, and I'm like, hello? And he's all, Andy! Andy! And I'm like, yeah, this is Max. The Max, right? And he's like, Andy, oh, my God. I need your help. Do you <laughs> still have a keyboard? Yes or no? Yes and I was like, me. and I was like, um, I really don't know. I'll have to call Mike and see if uh, that was one of the instruments that got taken with him from Noah and Patrick that had took an earlier flight and he was like okay yes and no yes and no yes and no and i was like no i'll have to, I'll have to give you a call right back you need okay, can you hang on about two minutes he was like yes but just call me right back it's emergency our, our, our keyboard exploded and i was like okay just give me two minutes so call up mike turns out the keyboard's still there and i was like which, okay which, which is a crazy coincidence because originally patrick and noah were supposed to take the keyboard nice. with them even better uh, when when they took the earlier flight, yeah, and because we were filming that thing, and they ended up having to run oh, to, yeah. to the room and run, run to the cab, we ended up skipping the instruments, and and yeah. and they they just took a couple bags and stuff with them. Otherwise, they yeah. were going to take it with them. So so I call, so I call Max back like immediately, like that like Chris and Mike were already up in the room. They were like, yeah, we'll bring it down. And, or we'd be there like ten, like down to the theater in like ten minutes. So I call Max back, and he's like, "Hello, hello, Andy. Yes, yes or no? Yes, please, please tell me, please tell me the an answer." And I was like, "I was like, oh yeah, we have we, we have one, we have one. We'll we'll have it down there like ten like ten minutes." And he was like, "Guys, guys, hang on, everybody, shut up," because they were doing like sound check at the time, <laughs> and uh, it was the entire Rat Pack, and it was great. And uh, and he's like. Andy from five and the boys from five year mission have saved the day. They're bringing us the keyboard. And you hear the entire rat pack in the, in the background, just cheering and clapping. Like, Woo! <laughs> and he was like, he was like, Oh my God, what can we do to repay you? And I was like, uh, can you let, uh, the band and some of the, some of our friends come backstage to watch the show. And he was like, Oh, it, at this point you can, you can have, have run of the backstage. I don't care. Just please bring it down here. And so we're we're like uh, I was like all right, and you were amongst those people that got to watch it backstage. I 
certainly was. That's right. You, Claire, Heather, and Jim. That was awesome. And uh, so we, so it's me, Mike, and Chris, and we're walking into the theater, like down from like the main entrance, like down towards the stage. And uh, I was like, Chris, all right, hang on. You're carrying the keyboard. Wait until we're about 50 feet away. I'm gonna yell something, and then just raise it over your head like like one of the like like one of one of the sand people from Star Wars. And uh, <laughs> get about 50 feet away from the stage, and I'm like. We came to save the day! <laughs> and they're all on stage cheering. Chris is holding it above his head, all celebratory. And, like, there were a bunch of people already in there waiting for the show to yeah. start, and everyone just started cheering. It was the most, it was the weirdest moment of the weekend. And then then we got to watch the whole show backstage. It was great. And then, and then my, my favorite part about the show is Max stepping off stage and towards us. He was, goes, thank you for saving the show, even though it's going home. <laughs> what a sense of humor he has! I I love Max so much. That guy is great. So it, it, one thing I want to point out to the the listeners out there who are who are following along with the story, we were sitting backstage, and we were sitting on the actual couches that the uh, celebrities were sitting on during their panels, which I thought was pretty cool. And of course, Claire, uh, being the, the the sick mind that she has. Actually oh, yeah. mentioned that they those were the couches they'd been farting on all weekend, <laughs> and I think we have the tweet to prove it. Yes, we do. So, yes. yes, that was a that was a pretty funny remark. But that that was a very cool experience. And Mike, you want to tell him about the most sur- surreal moment of Ooh. the weekend? Which one? Hashtag We Want Wharf. Oh. Oh. Yeah. That oh, that that God. was that was pretty weird. Very. It came together so quickly. Yeah. Uh, like with they asked us and then on with, sunday yeah w- within within like 15 minutes of them asking us we were on the the bridge of the enterprise taking pictures and and filming it it was so weird that went by so it was just so quick yeah it, like, like the, the the guy that runs the uh the hashtag we want wharf viral campaign with all the mini muffins and it, if, if if you don't know it, just look up "We Want Wharf" and those. There, it it explains the whole campaign. They're trying to get the uh, the Captain Wharf Star Trek Next Generation, the Captain Wharf Chronicles on the air. And so the guy that's in charge of that uh, apparently had some connections with Creation and CBS, so he was able to get in there and do some promo stuff on the TOS the the TOS replica bridge that they had built there. And he just came up, was talking to us, and. I don't know if it's because he knew who we were as a band. Well, he 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 did know who we were. Okay, I I didn't know if it was that or because there were five of us in full uniform standing next to each he, other at the time. He, he he already knew who we were, but the yeah the fact that we were dressed appropriately right. was was probably the most yeah. beneficial thing for him. Uh, so yeah, he he invited us to come onto the the bridge set that they had set up for <laughs> photo ops. And we were able to take a bunch of photos and 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 film these scenes of us making up dialogue. Yeah, about <laughs> and, a, about the whole like we want wharf campaign. Like they were feeding us like the gist of lines and everything. And uh, as usual, Chris and Fark were the best at making stuff up and <laughs> and acting. We're the improvisers. N- Noah looks like a deer in headlights. Oh my god. <laughs> And you know we never really. Got... And it was Noah that had to say had to say to say his lines over and over yeah. and over again too, which is even worse. Which is why they were late to, for their flight. We we never really got to me. I'm sure I probably yeah. would have been a bit a bit of a deer in headlights oh, myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. We we ended up running out of time, so we didn't get all like the close up. Well, yeah. Re- readings of lines for everyone. Uh, so. Apparently, apparently we weren't. We were only supposed to take a couple minutes, and it was supposed to be a quick thing. An hour. And we yeah we were in there for like an hour doing all this and and uh, I I think that that Dan might have gotten in trouble a little bit <laughs> a little bit yeah because <laughs> that's the, the that, that, that's the guy that's in charge of the campaign yeah Dan, Dan, Dan Deavy I believe his name is the uh, yeah, C- C- creation got a, got a little upset that we were that that he was taking so long in there they didn't realize they were like this is supposed well, to be open to the public there was yeah a, a lady came in that was yeah. kind of angry about it and she was mad because they had set up lights to light the set and and then uh you know she was kind of shooing us out of there 
and she said that there's a whole line of people outside waiting to get their pictures taken on the set. And as we were leaving, there were four people standing there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, is this open now? Yeah, we uh, yeah. we would have happily let them in to take their pictures. Well, obviously they didn't know who you were. Yeah, and and then and then go back to what we were doing if that was the case. She was just really overreacting, I think. Yeah. But you know, it 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 it, it was there for the photo ops, so I understand from from creation's standpoint that we were disrupting their flow. So yeah, that I I guess that was a surreal moment to be Very surreal. to be on the birds. We got a lot of pictures of it. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish we had been able to get a few more. Yeah, I've yeah. seen some of those pictures. They're pretty cool looking. Very cool looking. And uh, we we have some other pictures too that uh, will be available on Facebook. We have a, that awesome group shot. By the way, of all oh, of yeah, us, yeah, of, of me, me getting you in the sleeper hold. Oh, in the transporter, yeah, that was a good one, and the one in the vendor room, Roddy Piper style. Yeah, yeah. Roddy got Piper. Style. A good shot, also on the last day of uh, Chris and Andy and I going, oh. <laughs> going tinkle in the, the board with generators. Yes. <laughs> that was a great shot. My my favorite one so far though was the one from the vendor room where we were all uh, together. That was actually hanging in my office right now. My nice. favorite shot of the weekend was the Andrea. one that we took in the hall with uh, Andrea. The Andrea cosplay. <laughs> oh, that and was great. Dr. Corbin and, uh, and, and the stalactite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The phallic and, stalactite. Uh, I I have to say uh, I I've got a bit of a crush going on uh, on boner bait. Oh my god! <laughs> Still can't pronounce her name on Instagram. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. 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 yeah, on Instagram she goes by Boner Bait, and that's appropriate. Wow, so I, I don't have to bleep that because that's actually her name. It's actually her name. Yes, fantastic. That, 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 is, that is what she goes by. Okay. Um. Yeah. Her her real name is uh, Juliet or Ju- Julian, something Some like that. Like that that yeah. was uh, my favorite photo of the weekend. <laughs> so I know you guys didn't get to sit in on a whole lot of panels or full panels for the most part, but any particular panels that you did see that you really enjoyed? I got to see the beginning of I got to see the tail end of Delancey's and the very opening. Uh, Hello, how are you? Up to K. That's the only panel I got to see. Or oh no no I got to see the the intros for the very first panel of of, of on Thursday. That's it. I, I got to see about maybe ten fifteen minutes of Shatner and the beginning of Takei and the end of Delancey. And I I I saw uh, some of the Leonard Nimoy tribute. I saw the photo, the photo album tribute, and then and with uh, Larry Nemechek and oh, yeah. uh, I can't remember who the other guy was, the the guy that put the photos together. And uh, I saw that, and then I saw a little bit of of the Adam Nimoy panel right after that. But that that's really all I saw. Uh, most of the weekend I was at the booth or. Wandering around, causing trouble. <laughs> Go through. Like spinning around Lazy Susans too quickly? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, the other awesome moment of the weekend. Uh, the original Gorn, Bobby Clark, coming, oh, by, yeah. coming by our booth, and I was having no clue who he was at first. And then our video for Arena comes on the laptop that we had on display. Yeah, it just happened to be on when he was walking by. And wow. So, uh, what, did he, what did he say? Well, the, the uh, our first video for Arena or the one that we filmed the, the ourselves. Live action one yeah, that that one was the one that was on, and he and he saw someone in a Gorn mask doing things, and he said, "Who's who's who's that? Who's that in the Gorn mask?" And and I said, "Well, that's that's our friend Lee," and he said, "No, it's not. That's me." And I was like, uh, "Who's who's this crazy old guy?" <laughs> And then it, it only took a, 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 a second for us to figure out who he was because he was talking about being the Gorn. And so that video was ending, and so he saw that, like, the dancing part at the end, and he was getting a kick out of that. Yeah. And and then started talking to us about about him being the Gorn. And then right after that, our the, uh, the video for Arena that uses the episode footage came on. So he, he stood there and talked about about filming the episode throughout that whole video and was pointing out all the different scenes and uh that that was that was really cool yeah that was awesome like i I didn't even know he was there i was like off taking a break somewhere and i come back and they're like dude it's bobby clark 
I was like, uh, oh crap, the corn. <laughs> So we we got a picture with him too. Oh, that's yeah. great! Very cool. Well, what with your arena video playing in the background? I don't think so. I think it was over by then. Yeah. But uh, we 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 went to give him a copy of the album with with, with arena, arena on it, and he's like, "I already got one of these last year." <laughs> oh, wow. Because our booth was right next to him last year, oh, that's right. so we had already given him a copy, and so we gave him a copy of Fox, Fox Brain. Brain. Oh, speaking of your booth, I think you guys had a much better position in the room oh, this year. Yeah, much yeah. better. Yeah, you were kind of right by the entrance. Th- there was actually enough room to fit five guys. Yeah, I know. Which is usually not the case at conventions. No. So any final thoughts from you guys before we, we close up for the evening? No. Uh, well, we, we did. I, I know we had at least one question. Uh, My- Michael Pomero. Oh, yeah, I tweeted out if, any, if anybody had questions, but it was uh, fairly late in the game, so... Uh, <clears throat> But he's he's one of our hardcore fans yeah. in the Chicago area, and he's he's a doppelganger for one of our friends here in town. Yeah. Oh. When 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 we went to play the Adler Planetarium, I, swore it was him. I thought that it was the guy from here in town. I thought he had made Imagine. the trip to Chicago, and I was like, "What the hell are you doing here?" <laughs> and I had, I talked to him for like two minutes before I realized this is not the same guy. Wow. <laughs> That's how much he looks like this guy. Anyway, he 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 sent us a question in response to Andy, and he, he he wanted to know what kind of music we like to listen to when we're on tour. Don't, you know, traveling. Yeah. Uh, what is usually in? If Noah's in charge, a, 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 a lot of Journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least at least one Journey song usually comes up just so we can play air guitar and Mike can Mike can lip sync it. <laughs> Let's see. If Noah lately, the uh, past couple times we've gone out of town, Noah's been in charge at first, and it usually starts off, which I would probably be playing this, playing the same stuff. But a lot of like old like nineteen sixties garage, that's like lesser known. Like they put out like one or two forty fives, and then just like fell off the face of the earth. Uh, so like just really rare old sixties garage stuff, which I love. A lot of a lot of eighties stuff too. Lita, Lita Ford, Kiss Me yeah. Deadly. When it, when that's, 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 one, that's one of my all-time favorite car songs, Kiss Me Deadly by Lita Ford. When, it's so good. When it's when it's Noah, Andy, and me, and we're riding around, we we tend to – usually Noah will hand me his, his phone. Here, find something. And, and I'll go through and find the dumbest stuff and play it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we all sing along. Oh, yeah. A, 80s pop and mm-hmm. – uh, one time we listened to the entire Rick Springfield album, which is so good. Rick Springfield is actually really underrated. He was a great pop songwriter. Yeah, he's one of Noah's big inspirations. He, yeah, he really is. I mean, actually, the uh, Hey Kara is pretty much uh, di- like obviously directly influenced from it from Rick Springfield. <laughs> the more you know, his, his demo star space indie space. His demo sounds a little more Brian Adams, but. Uh. <laughs> So that question was just for you guys, right? You yeah. You don't care about what I listen to when I travel. I don't care what you listen to when you travel. All right. So you guys answered the, the – there was only the one listener question? There was only the one. I'm pr- kind of disappointed in everybody. Oh. I just, I, I just checked like two minutes ago if there were any more. No. All right. All right. Well, I guess that about wraps it up for uh, talking with you guys, and I'm sure we'll have you back on the show again very soon. Totally. And yeah. we're going to start up year two coverage soon, right? So everybody can look forward to that. As soon as all five of us are available again. Yeah, I think we I think we all collectively agreed that it would be sometime in September we'd start that back up yeah. again. Right? i got to get my notes together. you got to get your notes That's right. Yeah, every single time we've done the, – the, when we were doing the year one interviews, Mike always, would always make notes, and they're the funniest things. We'd always try to steal them just to see what he was going to say <laughs> and possibly steal something from them. <laughs> Well, I have to say the listener feedback we've been getting from those episodes is great, and I actually heard some at the convention, so oh. it's, uh, it's going over well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think everybody who everybody I know who's into Five Year Mission is, is into it, so I think hearing about the making of your songs is very intriguing to people. So I like to think so. Yeah. I like to think that we're interesting. Yeah, you're pretty interesting. I've, I've spent some time with you guys. I think I can corroborate that. I think so. So we'll close up with me uh, doing my gushing that I said I was going to do earlier oh, in the show because I, I forgot Jeff was going to cry. I didn't follow through, but you know, I, I I thanked you guys profusely while I was out there. So it probably sounds like a broken record, but you know, I really I had a great time hanging out with you guys at the convention. I uh, can't wait for next year. 
you guys really uh, went out of your way to make it a fun convention for me. So much appreciated. Thank you. Anytime, buddy. I don't hear tears. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's, not, Sorry. that's not the sound of crying. Yes, it was. Thanks, guys. Alright, we'll talk to you later, Jeff. Alright, take it easy, fellas. And that brings to a close supplemental log number 28, the first part of our wrap-up coverage of the 2015 Las Vegas Star Trek convention. We hope you really enjoyed this episode. We have some fantastic guests on. And next week will be part two of our convention wrap-up with some even more incredible special guests here to tell you about their experiences at the convention. We will talk to you then. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.